It's Thursday morning already. It's Thursday morning already, everybody. Welcome to Real Talk on this April 22nd. I do believe that this is the great episode, isn't it, Sam? It is, Of yes. all of our episodes, this is the great one. So, Welcome to... We don't, really, we don't really look at it like this. We don't really present them like this, but this is, in fact, episode 99. It is. And, and you know what's funny is I kind of have to correct the record on something because you asked me about episode numbers last week and I said, I think it was episode 93. And you said, oh, it's the Nuge episode, Nugent Hopkins. Yes. And uh, and then I looked after that show and was like, no, that was actually the Ryan Smith episode. Oh, the 94. 94. Yeah. And then I didn't say anything for the next couple of days because nobody's ever worn a 95 or a 96 for the oil. Ever. Ever. Yeah. Looked right? it up. Yeah. I looked at I, I was just like, okay, well, what player can I call out for those? And and I just well, I couldn't find one. Okay. This is, uh, we, we, had, we, we had a shout out yesterday on Twitter from the guys over at, at Oilers Nation, mm. uh, which I appreciated. This is a conversation maybe more well-suited to their independent media project, uh, which they've been doing for a number of years, but it was great to hear from them. Um, of course, we do come to you live every morning from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, and both uh, Sam and I, unabashedly hockey fans, uh, although last night didn't go that well. It, it wasn't that great for the Oilers. Uh, the, Mon- the Montreal yeah. Canadiens kind of, despite some magic from Connor McDavid and some, and some late-game heroics with the goalie pulled two goals in the last minute by the Oilers it wasn't quite enough to beat those filthy filthy (laughs) filthy Habs how fun is this Habs Oilers rivalry like did anybody see that coming this year and it's been a blast no one's going to be alive or nor at least nobody's going to be walking by the end of it if that keeps up um I'd I'd be curious to know like where our audience lands on 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 hockey fanaticism I'd be curious to know because we've also got people and you're going to see this from some of the notes that I can read today people are I mean we heard yesterday um from a listener I think it was Dr. Wade Kelly that was tunes in from Australia and we heard people that we're listening in from Vancouver Island and so <clears throat> we recognize that that you may not give a rip about the Oilers or you may not even give a rip about hockey if that is the case what's wrong with you uh but also that's okay and we won't spend too much time talking about it so no sweat we have a great show coming up today in about 15 eh, let's call it 12 minutes we're going to talk to an expert from Deloitte uh Deloitte uh, Kathy Woods is her name Deloitte has a report out uh building the future ready workforce what does a future ready workforce look like and what does this mean for you we we know and and recognize the obvious that this pandemic has had a huge impact on uh, not just the workforce in general, but in particular, many different industries based on where you are geographically, uh, maybe based on, on where you are with regards to your age demographic. You know, are you, are you a little later? Are you in the in the horizon of your career? Or as my dad always puts it, my dad speaks in seasons, and I always find it to be so beautiful. Are you in the autumn of your career? Um, or, or maybe are you are you in the, you know, what would it be, the early spring? I mean, are, are, you, are you just starting out? It's been difficult for a lot of people with regards to layoffs and streamlining and trimming the fat and and whatever euphemism they've they've used for well firing your ass or for letting you go or cutting you loose in the middle of a pandemic 
You know, we had a, we had a wild time in, in our neighborhood. At one point, uh, my neighbors on both sides, we'd, we'd get out in the summer uh, with all the, you know, the restrictions and everything like that. And everybody was finding ways to, to s- still socialize and do what they could, get the kids together in the summer. And so we'd do these back alley beers, uh, me and my two neighbors on, on either side. And, uh, you know, we, we'd, we'd have a beer. We'd, we'd all kind of stand on our back driveways and the boys would ride their bikes around in the back. And, and at one point, all three of us were unemployed. <laughs> And, uh, and, and it was for a period of like, you know, three or four months at one point. And, uh, and it was difficult. But for us at the same time, we thought, gosh, isn't this just a picture of what it's like for people right now with all three of us with, with all the time in the world on our hands right now because we got nothing going. There's, there's a bigger picture where that is the reality for people. And, and whether you see it evidenced in, in office vacancies in, in major Canadian urban centers, which isn't always the best barometer because we know that a lot of people are working from home, but still... Or whether you see it in, in some of the statistics we've been seeing from the federal government with regards to you know the CERB benefit or other benefits, EI, people talking about the economic or, or workforce implications of this pandemic, we know they're big. So this transformation in the workforce we know is driven by a number of different factors. And so Kathy's going to get into it uh, and get into it with us. And, and we hope that it's I mean, the reason we do these things, we get a lot of emails from people to talk at RyanJesperson.com, like like literally dozens, if not hundreds every day, literally. And uh, a lot of you are telling us what you'd like to see or what you'd like to hear on the show. And a lot of you tell us compelling stories about where you're at in your life. Uh, and if it is part of your unemployment or employment journey or whatever you want to call it, we hope that maybe you'll take something from this conversation with Kathy. That's coming up. In, you know, we'll call it 10 minutes time. And then for almost I'll say the rest of the show, although we do have a lot of emails and feedback we want to get to, uh, we're going to respond to some some questions we've had on social media. Obviously, there's been a lot of focus on the show this week following our interview with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. We really appreciate many of you sharing that interview around. I mean, they've been talking about the interview. I just have to say for a second in when, when, hey when this happens you have to talk about it you know real talk ryan jesperson is being discussed in the washington post the washington post and then we go oh yeah and also cbc the national and the globe and mail and the toronto star and it seems like people took notice of the interview and we're so grateful for it welcome to our new audience members but you have had some questions about that interview, and I want to answer them because I think they're interesting. I think the behind-the-scenes peak is really interesting. And then we're going to talk to the team, or at least six members, of a bigger team that came together and, and, and participated in, I guess we'll call it, I don't know if they'll call it this, but it, it's a pandemic project. That's exactly what it is. It, it's a book that's, that's just out. As a matter of fact, they've just sold out their first run, and they haven't even had their launch event yet. Their launch event is tonight, and they're already sold out, but they're printing more. And the book is called Midlife, and it's a stunning design, first of all. Uh, we're going to be talking to the cover artist. Look at this. Um, absolutely beautiful. That's Raymond Beisinger is the, is the cover designer there, the illustrator of that design. This is a group of individuals that, that work together uh, at the Gateway. Which, which you may or may not know, is the student newspaper, the official student newspaper, uh, or now they're calling it the official campus media source. I'm, I'm aging or dating myself here. At the University of Alberta, it's one of the more notable uh, publications, student publications in Canada. And I'm saying that as a former editor-in-chief of a university's student newspaper. We would always look to the Gateway as one of the big ones. Well, a whole bunch of former contributors and staffers and editors of The Gateway came together in this pandemic to, to publish a series of essays about midlife. And they're different and they're wonderful. I like this, how, how uh, Edmonton Journal arts critic Fish Grakowski, a good friend of this show, described it as a gorgeous, occasionally tear-jerking anthology of personal essays from a generation of widely dispersed gateway kids bumping into middle age. Uh, we're going to get into some of those essays. I, I uh, was reading one uh, by a good friend of ours, Adam Rosenhart, who's going to join us uh, as part of this panel. Six of them are going to join us. We'll split them up into groups of three. Um, and, I, and I'm getting choked up and I'm reading it, Sam. You know, we go live here and, and you gave me you were giving me my space this morning. I was I was I was I'm reading these essays 
and I was just sitting here in silence reading and you go, you go two minutes, Jespo. And I'm sitting there and I'm just choked up. I'm going, I, I'm going, I have, and it's, I go, I have to stop reading this essay by Adam Rosenhart or I'm not going to be able to talk. Knowing your dad is going to die soon shrinks your world, writes Adam Rosenhart in his essay. That's just one of them. Uh, th- I, I'm expecting a wonderful conversation with these writers, these contributors, these talented people that really, really wore their hearts on their sleeves. So that's coming up in about yeah, 20, 25 minutes time on the show today. It's going to be a wonderful show, and we're looking forward to some of the feedback we'll receive from you on the fly as well, of course, as we work it into what we talk about today. This show is proudly presented each and every morning by the team at Bitcoin Well. They want you to be focusing on your financial sovereignty. What does that look like? They'll tell you themselves. This does not mean sell all your investments, sell your house, cash in your RSPs, get out of your pension and put it all into cryptocurrency. That, that's not their advice. Their advice is to consider the, the 1% plan, which is an intriguing one. And why wouldn't you at this point? I mean, I'm doing it. Uh, now, I want to be careful here and... Have you understand that you should always talk to professionals and consider your investment decisions? This is not an official investment impetus, but what I do encourage you to do is talk to the team at Bitcoin Well if you have any questions about crypto, what you could do personally or with your business to, you know, broaden your horizons and diversify. You can find the link to what they do under the sponsors tab on our website, ryanjesperson.com. Real talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. We've got a ton of emails that I want to get to, and and many of them have nothing to do with what we're going to talk about today, but they're all these follow-ups to conversations we've had through the week, and and we want to let you know sometimes we want to put our emails right at the top of the show to remind you how much we value your perspective and how much we want to hear from you. Our our social media platforms have been bananas for the last couple of days, and we're doing our best to respond and and indicate gratitude or answer as many questions as we can. Love this one from Tyler Friesen. This is this is a heavy and this is a powerful email. As I read this, I was thinking, you know, when real talkers hear this, it's just about five sentences. But I thought this just this just walloped me. And, and I want you to think about what it's like when, when somebody like Tyler sits down to write this email. I, I want you to think what's going through their head or what prompted what, what, what were the five or ten minutes like for Tyler before he sat down to write this. He heard our interview uh, with Brianna and Peter Phipps, who told us amazingly their story, which, by the way, is being featured now on Sirius XM Radio. I'm not sure if you saw, Sam. We're going to call it the real talk effect uh, when people's stories get amplified and they come here on the show and it resonates with this audience because you are the ones that are amplifying the story. You're the ones that are sharing the link. You're the ones that are telling your friends about it. Tyler reached out and said, thank you so much for bringing that that interview about the religious cult to the forefront. Tyler says, I was not in a cult, but my family was religious and preached division and hate. I felt like I was programmed to hate people I've never met. I treated people so poorly until I attended university and deprogrammed myself. It haunts me to this day. Listening to your podcast had me teary-eyed. Thinking about this family and what they're going through, I hope they find closure. Thank you to them for sharing from Tyler. Boom. Wow. I was programmed to hate people I've never met. It haunts me to this day. Unbelievable, Tyler. I bet you you're writing for a bunch of different people that felt or feel the exact same thing and didn't take the time to write in. And I bet you you're speaking to them now. I really appreciate that. And then did you see the email that we got from my cousin Lisa again out of Germany this morning. Did you see this? Last time cousin Lisa wrote in, you remember it it was on the heels of our conversation with Chrissy Stroop. The, uh, what does Chrissy call herself? Not the, not the like reformed evangelical or the ex evangelical or something like that, but she's, she's whip smart, uh, joined us on the show. I think our interview was like 45 minutes or, or so. It's one of our most downloaded. Could have gone for two hours. Could have like, gone really? for, yeah. right? I mean, it yeah. could have gone for two days. I yeah. felt like it was one of those interviews and we really got into it. I mean, I talked about my faith journey a little bit. She talked about hers. It was very powerful. Uh, and Lisa responded to that. Uh, Lisa's family, she and her husband, Adam, and their beautiful kids have been over, um, just contributing in amazing ways to Black Forest Academy, which is a school, it's like an international school in Germany where kids go, many of their parents are missionaries. And so Lisa writes from a faith perspective, and her letters are powerful. Last time she wrote in, a whole bunch of people were like, who is that, your cousin Lisa? Who is this, what? 
She writes, hi again. They're writing in from the Black Forest of Candern, Germany. I love this. Real talk all over the world. Lisa says, I'm still so enjoying your show. I've resisted the urge to write an email every week as I continue to be inspired and moved by so many of the guests and topics of conversation. Says you and Sam putting this community together. It's remarkable. She says, I was listening to your assessment of Justin Trudeau's comments on travelers. Can you load that up for me, Sam? Justin Trudeau's comments on travelers coming into Canada from abroad, plus the comments around the hockey families that live abroad and are having to pay for hotels out of pocket. Lisa goes on to write about this, but if you missed it, I just want to play a quick clip. This was uh, my conversation with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau just a couple of days ago, exclusively on this show. We asked him about the explosion of COVID cases in India, like hundreds and hundreds of thousands this week. And and, and the very important question of, of basically why on earth are flights from India still arriving direct into Canadian airports. And here's what the PM had to say. We're always looking to do more based on the science, based on the need to keep Canadians safe. But I I, want to remind people that uh, from last March, a year ago, we brought in some of the toughest measures in the world. That two week quarantine that we sort of understand as being the base level necessary. A lot of countries didn't do that, didn't do that for a long while. And then when the variants started uh, appearing around uh, around the beginning of the new year, uh, we took extra measures with a pre pre-departure test necessary uh, and now an arrival test and now a government approved accommodation uh, waiting time uh, until your test comes back negative once you've landed uh, and far more checks on the two week quarantine uh, so that it's enforced. Like we have some of the strongest measures that mean uh, that the importation of cases and the spread from, uh, from overseas travelers is minimal. Now, it's not zero, so we need to continue to be vigilant. And I've asked people to take a look at uh, what more we can do. But I think people need to know already uh, that we have some of the toughest measures in the world. So that was Justin Trudeau on this show talking about Canada's travel measures. And, and, and then I go on to ask him about uh, international travel restrictions. Are they considering further restrictions? It prompted that message from Brianne, remember? Uh, the hockey wife that wrote in and talked about them being quarantined in a hotel and what an inconvenience it is for them. She says, we have a home to go to. We want to go to our home. We will quarantine. We will follow the rules. We just want to go home, right? And then a whole bunch of you chimed in. Some agreed, some disagreed. Lisa says, so, I, so I'm listening to this, and as we plan to move back to Calgary from Germany at the end of June, we're in the same dilemma ourselves. You know, WestJet just just canceled our booking with them. No refund. She says, we will get a credit, but she says that doesn't really do us any good as apparently WestJet doesn't have any flights to Calgary until well into July, which is way too late for us. We spent an additional 3500 bucks to purchase flights from Frankfurt to Calgary with Air Canada about a week ago. Just received notice that they too have been canceled and rescheduled. The problem with those flights, they're no longer direct. They have stopovers in Toronto. So how do we get from Toronto to Calgary? They're telling us we've got a quarantine in Toronto now. Currently, Air Canada, no direct flight from Frankfurt to Calgary. So Lisa says, we're happy to comply with Canada's rules around hotel and home quarantine. She says, I agree with Sam's assessment on the show yesterday that these rules need to be in place in order for society as a whole to follow them. She says, I've observed American missionaries in our community defying German COVID rules, even as guests in their home country. These kinds of violations would be fined severely if it was in Alberta. I'm not sure about that, Lisa. She says, so no, we can't all be trusted to do the right thing, even if it has proven effective in stopping the spread of this deadly virus. She says, I guess I'm just wondering how we can even get to Calgary. If Canadian Airlines are dropping flights, stopping services, how are families, our family of four, supposed to secure a flight home? Even after spending over $6,000 in excessive airfare, now we've been hunkered down In a small village of 7,000 people since last March, we can't wait to get home. We promise to follow the rules and stay put. Just please let us come home to Canada. She says, sending greetings and love to real talkers from Germany. Interesting international perspective there. Brianne, by the way, followed up. She wrote in, member about, she wanted me to ask a question of the prime minister specifically about hockey families. I wasn't able to fit it in. We had such a compressed time with him. But we discussed her question yesterday on the show, and it prompted a a pretty significant response from you, our audience. 
And she followed up and she said, I just, I'm big on follow-up, by the way. If you, if you followed my career for a long time, you know, especially when I, when I should eat a little crow myself, those are the ones I really want to follow up on. If somebody feels like I've, I've misrepresented their perspective or if somebody, you know, comes back and says, hey, hang on a second, you need to consider this. I think that's really important. I'm not eating crow here, but I think the follow-up's important. Brianne says, I, just, I wanted to thank you for bringing up my comment on your show on Wednesday, we, we all appreciate, all of us, you bringing attention to the situation we're facing. She says, unfortunately, especially after listening to you read comments, it doesn't look like much will change. And she says, and it turns out my skin isn't as thick as I thought it was. She says, it was nice for you to stand up for us in terms of income, even though your numbers were a little high, in my opinion. Which is fair. I, I guess I speculated People were talking about the rich hockey families and boo-hoo for the rich hockey players. And, and I said, hang on, keep in mind, these are players that are playing pro in Europe. Uh, they're obviously fantastically skilled. It's no comment on that. But I'm just saying they're not making a ton of dough. Um, I, I, I pegged it at, in my estimation yesterday. I said about, I would guess, 75 to 300 grand. She said, well, maybe that's a little high. She says it's frustrating having you defend our income over and over when people are just uneducated about the subject. It's also, by the way, none of their business. The point isn't that we can't pay. It's that we shouldn't have to. People seem to be obsessed with this aspect of the argument. And it's true, Brianne. I mean, if you want real talk, you know, real talk is that people lack sympathy for celebrities and wealthy people uh, in almost any circumstance. Because they have money. I mean, that's just real talk. I mean, I, I would love for somebody to prove me wrong about that, but, but I would go so far as to say that's a fact. If you have money, people will have less sympathy for you. Brianne says, through this process over the last few months, I am realizing that people are hurting, and it's really hard for, for people to see through their own hardships and frustrations and fears, and this is what makes people lash out and say negative things, especially on social media. If it was their life, their family, I'm sure they'd be a bit more open-minded. Thankfully, we have the support and love of many around us at home and overseas. She says, keep doing your thing with real talk. And then she she gives me one of these, like one of these, like, yeah, you know, for those that are listening to the podcast, like it's not the devil horn that you would throw up like with Ozzy, right? It's not it's not like with your your pointer and your pinky raised and the rest, you know, you can tell I grew up in an evangelical circle, the goat's head I'm describing it as. Um, that's what the fear mongers used to call it. Uh, but what, what's this one, Sam? It's not the hang loose with just the thumb and the pinky. It's the other one. Yeah. It's more like the rock on symbol, I the, guess. The rock what on symbol. It. Yeah. Yeah. I think you nailed it. I think yeah, if you say the rock, say rock on, there if you, you say the rock on symbol, I think everybody knows exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Well done. So, so Brianne gives the rock on signal and I'm going to say that's not just to us. I think that was to real talkers as well. Keep the comments coming. Keep the letters coming. We appreciate it. I'd love to hear your, your response to this. Um, <laughs> I'm hearing some, some people still just those. That's, that's fine. I mean, you know, one, one guy said to me the other day, I think it was on the chat. He said, you are. He said, he said you're being the devil's advocate here on behalf of the haves. And, and I, I actually walked with that comment yesterday, to be honest with you. I was like, I'm, I'm advocating on behalf of the haves. Um, which would sort of imply that there's, there's haves and have nots, which is true in life, but it's purely subjective, right? I mean, if, if, you, if you're a have not in one circle, you're a have in another circle, right? I mean, I, I went to Ethiopia for three and a half weeks to shoot a documentary 10 or 12 years ago. I mean, I'll talk to you about have not. And sometimes haves, depending on what that even means, deserve advocacy too, Right? I mean, the show will fight for social justice, but that doesn't mean we don't represent different perspectives. Anyway, I digress. Keep the comments coming. Use the hashtag RealTalkRJ. Let's keep it trending. And let's get in in just a second to a conversation on updating the workforce. Very quickly, we wanted to remind you that the team at Eden Landscaping right now, speaking of rock on, they're ready to rock. Should I turn this into like a boulder? I think I might turn this into like a boulder ad read. Speaking of rock on, if you've ever thought about adding a big feature boulder to your I think front you need lawn, a little, little bit more of a gravelly voice on this one. Oh, Sam, very well done. Should I start with a fresh slate? <laughs> I'm trying to find a way to work granite into a sentence, but I just don't know if it's oh, gonna. Yeah. I don't know if it's what gonna you- work. <laughs> We're going to have like our geologist friends chiming in and saying, you left like 15 good puns on the table with that spot. Eden Landscaping for more than 20 years has been putting projects like big boulders 
into people's lawns. You know, we used to have like kind of a, re- not a retaining wall, but the, our property, the house I grew up in was edged with boulder. And it was like one of the coolest things I've ever seen. As a young kid, you could run along, scurry along the boulders. Don't deny your children that opportunity to scurry across boulders. Go to landscapeevanton.ca right now and check out what these guys can do. They design the project, plus they build it. No need for a third-party landscape architect, and they do amazing work. We're proud to partner with Eden Landscaping. Also, big shout-out to the team at Friesen Brothers. You've got your license to grill, and now it's time to wrap your mind around barbecue season. I don't care if it's you know 30 degrees Celsius and sunny where you are, or if you woke up to a blanket of snow, barbecuing season is upon us. And so whether it's plant proteins or Alberta beef, pork, turkey, chicken, you're looking to grill, you'll find none fresher than you will at Friesen Brothers for more than 65 years, Alberta grown and Alberta owned. Well, I I suspect that this will not just be of interest to those that are that are looking for work right now that are either unemployed or underemployed. It seems these days everybody is looking for ways to reimagine or reinvent themselves to remain relevant to their employer or to maybe start fresh on their own. The team at Deloitte has put together a report, Building the Future Ready Workforce, Unleash the Potential of Your Organization and People. Kathy Woods, kind enough to join us from Deloitte this morning. Kathy, welcome to the show, and a good morning to you. I think we have you on mute, Kathy, but we will get it figured out right away so we can hear you, because I know you have... There we go. There we go. Better? It is very. Yes, Thank absolutely. You. First of all, I don't usually open an interview like this, but can I say your glasses? I absolutely love your glasses. Thank you. You know what? Um, these are relatively new glasses, uh-huh. and I kind of have a thing for glasses. Um, but you're the first person who said anything about them. So thank you. Are you? Oh, man. You know, I'll tell you the truth about something. I have I, I used to have an eyewear sponsor and I have so many glasses, uh, but none of them are newer than five years old. They're all old and I'm getting sick of all of them. But I think I'm actually intimidated. I think we're working towards a metaphor here right now in the workforce, by the way, unintentionally. <laughs> um, but I'm intimidated to go get new glasses because it's like it, it's a it's a whole new thing. Like glasses define your look for like the next five years. Yeah, well, and now I mean, you can go online and get your glasses now, right? I mean, we could we could segue this into the workforce. Let's do thing, it because who needs your optician anymore when you just <laughs> go to peepers.com and you can try them on online and buy them for thirty seven bucks and who knows when they're going to be delivered. Okay, well, if you're game to dance, I'm game to dance with you on using this as a metaphor to get into conversations on the workforce and and we'll look at this through that lens, if you will. We'll frame it that way, <laughs> Kathy. We are being so cheesy today, but we just can't help ourselves what what? would you get focused please oh girl i know we're ready to rock and roll here i'm so excited to have you playing ball on this one hey what 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 prompted this report why did deloitte decide to take a look at this so this whole issue of future ready workforce is something that we've been we've been talking about for a long time i mean the the overarching theme is future of work how is work changing? What's technology doing for us? Is there going to be a ro- robot apocalypse and we're all going to be out of work? And that's been something we've been talking about for a while. But to be honest, Ryan, COVID has brought it into focus in a big way. Yeah. I mean, it has suddenly accelerated people realizing that we need to work differently, the place we work is different, and frankly, that the skills and the capabilities we need are changing and they've changed overnight. So um, we were already on this path of looking at it, but COVID has accelerated it and we're much more passionate now about saying we've got an opportunity to really jump on this and change the way we work, change the opportunities that Canadians have in the workplace, and then help us all build the skills and capabilities we need to be successful, whether you're a have or a have not. I, I, you are just tying everything up with a bow and I love it. Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to admit something. I feel like I'm guilty of, of, uh, I'm going to be redundant of under understanding of not fully grasping the implications of this pandemic on the workforce and on industries, because I think part of me thinks, you know, the, the, the economy has been tough. So companies are having to streamline. There's been some financial implications here and there would have been more if there hadn't have been supports from government. Let's be honest about that. Uh, the other one is the obvious work from home implications. And we see that evidenced in, in downtown office vacancies and things like that. But it goes way further than that. 
right? I mean, what am I not even recognizing at this point? So, I mean, I, it's almost hard to know where to start because yeah. it, it does go way further. So let's start organizationally. So by industry, you've got everything from the industries where this has suddenly accelerated um, business for them. Look at the grocery chains. Um, look at uh, the tech companies. Then you've got industries that have just suddenly, it's fall, they've fallen off a cliff. Look at some of our retailers um, and, and how have they transitioned to online retail? Have they been able to do that? Um, and then you've got the ones in the middle. So you've got from a, a, an industry perspective, significant shifts. I, I know you're sitting out in Western Canada and you know I thought that our oil and gas companies were going to um, kind of that this was going to be the death knell. And we all know that you guys have had a pretty tough time of it. But what I've really been um, enheartened by is that so many of the oil and gas companies have said, okay, we really need to think about what does this mean for us? What does this mean for our economy? So how are we going to not only look at the future of energy, but figure out how we bring technology in in a different way to make ourselves more productive, more profitable, and then to reskill the workforce. Um, so that's the organizations. You, you talk about workplace, like, yeah, we're all working from home, but that's created completely different ways of working. So how do you do a performance review? How do you even tell if I'm performing? I mean, you know, actually I've just been, you know, I made my bathroom into a spa. I don't really work. I just do these odd little interviews and that's it. <laughs> Obviously not the case. But that's a big question. How, how, do our, how do we as leaders engage with people? So this whole interaction model is different. Um, it's changed not only those interpersonal skills, but then the skills we need cognitively. How do we think differently? How do we analyze stuff? So that's kind of about the way in which we work. And it's completely shifted who, how we can think about our workforce. So how many people said, hey, I've got a job for you and it's in Alberta, it's in Toronto, you, you pick the spot. We can now look at people who are working anywhere in the country. And so I think that creates a huge opportunity for many of our marginalized Canadians because now it doesn't matter where you are. We can think about how can we create opportunities for people in, in areas of the country that have um, not had, not had a strong economic situation or as many opportunities to work and or, we can push skills out to them. Or, or we recognize maybe even different barriers to entry, right? We talked to uh, federal minister, Mary Monsef yesterday about rural broadband internet, for example, right? And you may have people where, where something else may have stood in their way of a previous opportunity. Whereas now it may just be the access to reliable high speed internet. I mean, there's different challenges potentially. Yeah. And so there's a great example on that one. Um, we were working with an organization in a relatively rural part of Ontario, um, a fairly traditional organization where they'd always worked in the office and suddenly they all had to work from home. And part of the things that this organization started to talk about was, wow, how can we think about partnering with the tech firms to actually improve broadband in the community? So not only can we recreate the way we're working and work differently from home, but we can also then make an impact on the community in general. Kathy, how, how much of this is, is age or demographic specific? I mean, you, you just touched on marginalized Canadians, which could refer to a number of things, right? Socioeconomic status, which may relate uh, to someone's ethnic background, their geographic background. This could be uh, messaging directed, for example, at women that have faced barriers to entry into the workforce or, or younger people or older people. Um, you know, I remember, and I don't know why this emails of the thousands of emails that we've received since we went on the air um, five months ago tomorrow, uh, we've received thousands. I remember one from Phil. I remember his name was Phil, and he wrote in, and he's a 50-something worker, a talented, skilled worker. The guy's never been late for work. The guy's taken his job seriously. He's a proud worker. He's been laid off, and he's really concerned because he feels like he's still got a lot to give. I'm paraphrasing his message. He's still got a lot to give. He's not close to retirement. He doesn't want to be, but he recognizes that he's older and he's concerned about it. Uh, how do we approach this part of the conversation? Well, okay, now you're getting really close to home because Phil, I would be one of those 50 somethings as well. Um, 
Ryan, this is where you jump in and you say, really? I'm, I'm, I'm blown away by that. I mean, I, I, I didn't, um, <laughs> I, I didn't, I didn't want to ask why Deloitte was allowing a 21 year old to speak on their behalf, Kathy, okay. but, but you do. Well you. done. Okay. Um, but, but I think this is really an important, an important question. And in fact, I did a panel yesterday and somebody wrote in the same question. What does this mean for those of us who are older, who haven't grown up in the social media world, who haven't been on tech, you know, five different tech platforms all the time. So what I would say to Phil and, and to myself and to, to lots of other colleagues is we talk, when we talk about skills and we talk about what we bring to the table, we often go first to the, the tech skills to, are you a data scientist? Um, do you know what UI and UX and how to design a website? Um, what, what kind of data analytics do you know how to do? Those things are all important and we should be thinking about them and learning them. But at the end of the day, what we're seeing is those skills change so fast. The half-life of a skill is something like two and a half to five years, depending on what research you look at. Wow. So look at enduring skills, things that last. Um, I mean, my daughter's about to go to university. I figure she'll learn some great stuff. But when she graduates, hopefully in four years, I bet you she can't really learn use much of the technical skills she's learned when she graduates. What she's going to need to think about, and Phil, what I bet you have, are what are those skills or capabilities that are going to endure? The, the curiosity, the willingness to experiment and try new things, um, the ability to collaborate and build relationships and connect with people, because those are the things that we find endure no matter what. And, and I'd say the last one to look at is learning to learn the mo- like it doesn't really matter what you know, but can you learn quickly and can you adapt quickly? Can I? So I'd say d- dive into those. Can I? Yeah, just just to get personal for a second, something tells me you won't mind. I, I suspect we might get along, Kathy, if we were to hang out in person. <laughs> um, when you talk to your daughter, like if or assuming that she consulted you or ran plans by you, or you talked around the dinner table about her plans. It's, you know, here's so many interesting conversations these days. I, I've talked to advocates for, for women in STEM, for example, and, and, and attracting more women into those fields, or I've heard more people advocating for trade schools and polytechnic schools and, and reminding skilled and talented young students that you don't have to have a university degree to, to be considered accomplished or to have potential. And, and we look at all different, I mean, even to go extreme, we look at, you know, Mark Zuckerberg and Bill Gates who dropped out of university because they didn't feel like they were a fit there. And some of the great innovators of our time have, have not fit that structure. In the context of this conversation, what, what were some of the pieces of advice that you shared with your daughter, whom I would imagine you care about more than anybody else on planet Earth? Um, really good question. See, now you went straight to my heart. But, but I think that the most important thing that I've shared with her is you need to figure out, you need to follow a path that you love. Go and follow a passion. Do what you love that you can personally engage in, and then the rest won't matter. And whether you've got a university degree or a tech school degree or nothing, there will be times when that's gonna make it harder or easier, when it will open the doors or it won't. But at the end of the day, if you're not loving what you do, you're not gonna do it well, And you're not going to bring to the table what you need to to bring to the table. The second piece of that that I said is you might not know exactly what you love right now. And that's okay too. You can change. You, You can start down one path and then you can shift. I mean, I started my career as an engineer and I am not doing mechanical engineering anymore, as you can probably tell. So do what you love and recognize that it is going to change and grow. I'm still trying to be, decide what I'm going to be when I grow up, but yeah. you know that's another story. You and me both. Uh, can I tell you, I, I, I'm very proud of the technical producer of the show. It was Samuel G. Brooks that you would have been corresponding with off camera to get framed up properly and everything. You know, Sam is an engineer as well. Sam's a graduate engineering program as well. We're I need, I need to start here. a club for engineers that aren't engineers anymore. There's, there's quite a few <laughs> exactly. of us floating around there. Reformed yeah. engineers. Would you guys That's still right. all wear your pinky rings? Don't you all have pinky rings? Isn't that the thing? Oh, oh, I, oh you, you, okay. Hang on a second. What is going on here? I'm going to get out of the way. So you, can, can you explain to us, both of you explain to us, neither of you are working as engineers, but, oh, is this a, are we not, why, why are you still wearing your, are you Illuminati? 
Well, well yes. that's what I was going to say. Oh. Yeah. You got to be like, I thought you were going to ask us about the ceremony and that's a big secret. That, that's true. The ceremony is a big secret. What I did get is both of you on the record to acknowledge that the Illuminati is a thing. Neither of you said <laughs> what Illuminati. <laughs> Let me ask you this uh, before this turns into a total spectacle, Kathy. Um, what... Uh, People that are sitting here right now, I mean, we're, we're having a great conversation, a parallel conversation on our live chat right now. People watching us on YouTube and they're talking about, you know, businesses that had I saw one viewer say something as small as the add to cart option on their website before the pandemic. What an advantage they had as opposed to the businesses that had to scramble to catch up um, that weren't maybe geared up or ready. And, and, and quite frankly, who could blame a lot of them because the pandemic walloped so many of us. But how do you determine if your workforce or if your not if you as a person, but if your company, uh, the people around you are ready for, you know, are future ready, as you say in the Deloitte report? Um, how do you determine that? Uh, it's a big question and a tough question. I think the thing you do is you. You just start and where you start is by figuring out where do you think you're headed in the future? We have a lot of people who come and ask us, what are the skills we need for the future? Give us the list. And yeah, we've got a list of the things that we think are most important and are going to be in highest demand, but that's not what's really important. What's really important is where do you see your company going in the future? What do you want to be when you grow up? And think about a few scenarios because we know things are going to change. And then when you do that, start to break it down, go function by function or business by business and say, okay, if this is where we're going, then what does that mean in terms of the skills that we think we're going to need? Where are we going to get those skills? Because that's the other part of it, Ryan, is part of it is about helping your workforce reskill, upskill, build the new skills, or even identify the capabilities that they have now that they didn't realize they had that curiosity, flexibility, adaptability, ability to connect. Um, but then the other part of it is, how do you think about the workforce entirely differently? Maybe there are people who you're gonna use on a contingent basis, on a part-time basis, and how do you pull them in? So I think it really is about stepping back and thinking about where do you wanna go? Um, get curious yourself and explore the art of the possible and then just translate that back step by step. And don't try to eat. It's a it's a tough question. Don't try to eat the elephant in one bite. It's mm. one bite at a time. You had no way of knowing this, but I saw a picture yesterday of two hunters standing over a dead elephant. And I was so enraged for like an hour and a half. I had to, I know, <laughs> I know I had to go for a walk, uh, but it's OK. The other day I was talking to a buddy who said, you know, there's more than one way to skin a cat. And I said, hey, maybe you should reconsider your choice phrase i said i'm not i don't know i don't actually know anybody i don't think that's at least publicly acknowledging to skinning cats these days but uh hey, you know what i think is um this is what the show does kathy it just swerves around through the ditches and then it finds the road Love again it. finds the road every once in a while um i think that the reason and the reason why i was so excited to talk to you uh, is because the impetus really is, and, and in closing, I want to ask if you would agree with me here, because using my powers of observation, I dug into this Deloitte report, and, and there were two things. Number one, three quarters, 74% of organizations, that's a big number, 74% say reskilling their workforce is important or very important to their success over the next year to year and a half, okay? 74% acknowledge it's very important. However, only 17% of organizations believe that they're able to anticipate the skills their workforce will require. 16%, one six, expect to make significant investments in learning over the next three years. So basically, unless I'm misinterpreting this data, workforces, employers, companies recognize that they need to get on this. However, very few of them are going to actually invest in it on behalf of their employees. Yeah, so I think that um, I think that if you did that survey again, you'd probably see the number of people who are investing it going investing in it going up. Yeah. But the key point of it, Ryan, I think, is that there's a huge need and we have to get on it. Um, the other part is yes, we need to invest in it, but the investment doesn't need to be massive. There are all kinds of ways of upskilling your workforce. Um, you can use LinkedIn Learning. There's all kinds of stuff out there right now. I think the key thing is how do you essentially unleash your workforce so that they can learn 
in their day-to-day work. They can learn in the flow of what they're doing. They can learn what they need to learn when they need to learn it. And back to Phil, um, this doesn't all have to be online on LinkedIn. It can be through apprenticeships and mentorships and and learning on the job from people who've done things before. And not only can Phil or Kathy in my case, help people develop some of the capabilities that they need, but at the same time, I'm learning some of the new things. This morning, I just talked to one of my, uh, one of my um, younger colleagues about how I get better at using LinkedIn as a matter of fact. Yeah. Are you, are you, are you big on LinkedIn by the way? Um, I was told I should never say no comment, but I am, I am medium on LinkedIn. Let's yeah. just say, is I that just, fair? I, I don't, I don't know. I, but I'm, I'm maybe not LinkedIn's target audience, but I, I just think it's so weird. It's such a weird platform. And I know some people say it's so important for business. Some of my friends, LinkedIn is like their go-to, um, you know, oftentimes I actually, I blew it a couple of years ago, a, a big hosting opportunity. And, uh, I, uh, months later, I, I run into somebody and they said, yeah, we were surprised you never got back to us. I said, what are you talking about? They said, well, we sent you a message on LinkedIn. I was like, who sends a message? That's like leaving a voicemail. Who sends a message on LinkedIn? Obviously, I didn't, but then other people, it's kind of a big thing. I, I never know how to how to manage LinkedIn. Yeah, I mean, I, in my mind, it's, there. see, we're going down to interesting oh, you're, territory you're being, here, you're Ryan. Being, you're being so I'm, careful right now. I'm being careful on this. In my mind, so I think LinkedIn is ex- extremely important from a business point of view. You do? Okay. Um, in, in, in a former life, I did a lot of, I worked for a company that did a lot of recruitment. And so, I mean, LinkedIn has completely changed the way you access talent. Um, we use it hugely. Um, so I think it has a different, there's different ways to use LinkedIn for different people, just like any of these other platforms. Right. Like you send me a, an instant, I don't even know what it's called an instant message on Facebook. I'll never see it. Yeah. Um, I, I barely even know what Facebook is anymore. I mean, I'm an Instagram person cause I have a daughter who's about to go to university. Right. So I think there's also these things all ebb and flow. And I think you need to use them for the, it's the right tool for the right job. And, but even, even this, what we're talking about, I mean, this is just a casual conversation about social media platforms, but it is relevant to the workforce. It is relevant to industry. Right. I mean, when I, you know, when I got canned from my radio job about six months ago, you know, the first thing somebody said to me, somebody that, that's a smart person said, y- you're going to need to get on your LinkedIn and really beef up your profile. And I was like, I don't want, you know what, like that, that made me more discouraged. I was like, nah, I'm good. I'm going to go for a walk. Um, <laughs> you look like so you ignore say- it at your peril. If you like completely that- ignore it at your peril, yeah. but you don't have to be the God of LinkedIn. That's a, that, that's very good advice. That is the type of measured advice. It's like a bifocal perspective there from Kathy Woods, who is the national. This is like the worst. I'm a, I've officially. Did I make it clear for you? You made it very clear. Thank you very much. I, I became my grandfather in this interview today. Um, and so I thank you for helping me transform into that, which is no surprise, considering you are the national workforce transformation leader for Deloitte Canada. Kathy Woods, um, I'm already looking forward to the next time we talk. Thanks for doing this. I can't wait. Thanks, Ryan. You bet. You can read that uh, report yourself. You go to Deloitte.com or you can follow them on Twitter at Deloitte. Let me know what you think. I've been seeing some interesting comments here on on the live chat. Uh, um, You know, uh, some of you are saying, hey, listen, there's still, you know, people are still going to need people, right? Not everything's going to go digital. Kim says, don't undersell human-centered jobs. And I do agree with Kim. She says they will combine with digital, but people-focused work will not go away. It will just change. Our need for people will not stop. Uh, which is a great point to make. Um, we're watching the marvelous Mrs. Maisel right now. Have you seen this series, Sam? It's I have not. I've heard so many good things, I think, and I just I haven't cracked it yet. I feel like you would love it. Um, there's a great style to it. It's set in the late 1950s into the early 1960s. I won't spoil too much of it, but um, you know, I think of oftentimes like there's there's this time where she she's working as a telephone operator right like I'll put you through hold one moment I'll put you through and they're like pushing the cables into the different you know what I mean and you think when when that job disappeared as an example um didn't that mean that there were ultimately down the line a whole bunch of jobs for people working in mobility and tech and you know cellular phone technology right I mean I mean there's a million examples and I hope that this is speaking directly not just to people that are you know, have been working as, as, as rig hands and, and now you, you know, you're trying to wrap your mind around transitioning to an, a career in new energy or, or maybe that somebody that worked in traditional media 
uh, you know, newspaper or you worked in, in radio or television sales and now you're trying to figure out how to navigate new media, digital media, modern media, we call it. Um, I mean, I think that there's things here to take away for everybody. Another one of our viewers this morning said, you know, both of my parents are having a hell of a time finding work. I can't find the comment in particular, but basically said this is ageism at play. Both of them qualified, ready to work, can't find a job. We want to hear your stories. You can either hit us up on the live chat at risk of us missing it. Uh, you can hit us up at Real Talk RJ. That's our hashtag, and it's powered by the team at Park Power. Uh, Park Power is serving Albertans right now when it comes to internet, electricity, and natural gas. And if you go to their website right now, parkpower.ca, you'll see where you can sign up, and then you'll see a chance to enter a promo code. That promo code is 2021 dash Real Talk. 2021 Real Talk will get you $70 off your first bill. And we love hearing when you sign up. Let us know and use the hashtag, the team at Park Power. Their social media game is strong and they love to push it out too. We have a lot of fun working with them. Plus, 10% of their profits go back into the community, which is something we absolutely get behind. Uh, so check out parkpower.ca today. Also, encourage you to check out Kubi Energy. Speaking of presenting sponsors on this show, Kubi presents positive reflections each and every Monday or at least our first day of the broadcast week where we get things started on the right foot. Your positive reflections, pictures, videos, stories you think the audience needs to hear, send them into talk at ryanjesperson.com. Kubi is a team based out of Edmonton and Kamloops serving Western Canadians who are diversifying their energy sources with solar. They're Tesla certified and they want to talk to you today at kubienergy.ca. Well, I'm very much looking forward to this next, well, who knows how long it's going to be, maybe an hour. We have six guests that have agreed to uh, join us. We're going to take the conversation on uh, three at a time. This is a, a book project, but, but, but I think it's, it's probably more than that we're going to learn. It's called Midlife, and this is a group of, of a whole bunch of, of former staffers and contributors and writers and illustrators and photographers and designers that worked at the Gateway. My people. The University of Alberta. Sam's people. Sam, weren't you? You have a connection. Oh, look at this. You've already brought him on camera. They, <laughs> they, 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 they can just sit here and watch you and I talk. But but what's your connection to, to the Gateway? You have a connection here, don't you? Oh, oh man. Yeah, no. I, I started volunteering for the Gateway right my first year of university. I was an avid photographer there. Uh, I sat on the board of directors. I actually chaired the board of directors for a while. That's when I got weirdly nerdily interested in media governance, which is a whole... Strange side thing. I uh, went on to work for Canadian University Press right after that. So this is right up your alley. This is right up my alley. I love this. This is fantastic. Are you going to be um, able to focus today? So a lot of the people on the panel were the people that like my generation of the Gateway looked up to. So Ooh. like just seeing them come on the screen, I was just like, oh, these are my heroes. Oh, can you put them on camera now so we can watch them all blush? Look at them. Yeah, they are all blush. Sarah Chan is is looking a little flustered, perhaps. Adam Rosenhart with those rosy cheeks. I, I love it. Uh, Jennifer Pabliano, uh, welcome to the show. The three of you let me, let me do quick introductions here so i do this justice um sarah is a musician a teacher a writer a social advocate a mom of two uh who wrote for the gateway arts and entertainment section from 98 to 2002 um easily one of when we took you there full screen sarah i have to say i'm going to immediately put you into the top 20 all-time real talk backgrounds i'm going to say top 20 and and you may get bumped into the top 10 uh, with an audience vote we'll see how that goes uh <laughs> Jennifer, Jennifer, am I pronounced? Is it Pablano? Is that how you say it? Yeah, yeah, that's that's good. No, can you say it so I can say it better? Oh no, no, you're right. You said it. No, okay, 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 okay. No, don't worry. No. So you were the Gateway News Editor um, from 2001 to 2003, the Alberta that's Bureau right. Chief for Canadian University right. Press. After that, uh, <laughs> yes. now a Project Manager with the City of Vancouver and a Master's Degree in Journalism from UBC. Yes. It's wonderful to have you here on the show. And and rounding out the first half of our panel discussion, Adam Rosenhart was once. The editor in chief, the opinion editor, the arts and entertainment editor at Gateway. Um, he's uh, pursued a wonderful career in marketing and communications, working at ad agencies for more than 10 years. Uh, lives in Edmonton with his beautiful wife, Rachel, and their two cats, Grizz and Dot Com, which is one of the most amazing cat names I've ever heard in my life, Adam. It's a it's a 30 Rock reference. Yeah, I was about to say it's a 30 Rock reference. It's lost on me, and I apologize. Not everybody can watch every show, and and I and I have no justification or reason why I've not watched Thirty Rock, but I've never watched a single full oh. episode. Never, not a single full episode. I know, I know. I think we're in for a treat. Jam. Yeah, oh, you inter you jam. interviewed Sachi Cole, and and she said Thirty Rock was a show that you should watch. She did. 
Um, but a lot of people every day say that there's things like, I mean, people say I should run <laughs> stairs and lift weights every day. It doesn't mean that I but do. Are Adam. they us, Ryan? They're, 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 us? they're not, they're not you. Uh, they're not you. <laughs> Um, and, and, and I acknowledge that and, um, I'm really excited to have the three of you here. I'm excited to just hang out and mostly get out of the way and hear about this project because each of you have written essays, uh, which are like hard on your sleeve, uh, in your case, Sarah ink on your sleeve stories. And I've absolutely loved reading them, but then there's also the, there, there's also the story of the project itself. Um, so Sarah, why don't we start with you? How did this even come about? It was really random. I I believe we all understand what the last year has been like with the uh, up and down, the back and forth, uh, the the whiplash uh, on many fronts uh, out there in the world in terms of viruses, politically, racially, socially, and personally uh, at home. We're all dealing with this difficult time and um and it's a marathon of a difficult time. And uh, the actual story is. I was randomly making a broccoli sandwich, which is a weird kind of sandwich to have. And I was receiving a philanthropy reward award uh, in late November. And it occurred to me, I was like, oh, whatever, it's no big deal. Like uh, so many people get this. It's just, they're just handing them out. Like who cares? And then I thought, hold on, Sarah, you're doing that thing that now that you're a grown up, you're recognizing that you probably should stop doing. And I think a lot of and I'm not to make this a gender thing, but I think a lot of women do this. And I think people, no, a lot of people do this. They dismiss their achievements. And so I thought, okay, I don't know to be, I don't need to be a douchebag and, uh, you know, post this on every single thing everywhere to uh, perpetuate my greatness to the world. But I am going to text a friend and just say, you know what? I noticed that I dismissed myself and I'm just proud that I caught myself doing it. And she sent me the introduction to her new book. She's actually a contributor in midlife, uh, Leanne Brown. And in it, she writes about exactly what I had experienced. And upon reading it, I was reconnected and reminded that my friend is such a talented writer. And then the next thought I had after that was, hold on, Sarah, you are a writer too. Don't forget that. And then on, um, uh, I think a day later, I called Jen Pabellano and I said, Jen, I forgot that I was a writer. And she was like, well, duh, like, where have you been? <laughs> and then we decided to create a project to bring our friends back together, to recognize ourselves again, again, as creatives and writers, but to also recognize that we belong to a community of friends and creators. And four months later, a book has been published. I, I don't have data, uh, but I have anecdotal evidence to support the assertion you made that that women do, I think, disproportionately dismiss their achievements. I, I think even in, in political coverage and commentary and Jennifer, I'll get out of your way so you can address this. But but I actually think that women underestimate their their either their political potential or, or women have to be more convinced to run, whereas men are very confident in in, in their right in their abilities or or their appropriateness as a candidate jennifer would you agree uh yeah actually brian i've read a really good book about this it's called top dog by poe bronson oh yeah and it actually talks about how men's uh um men evaluate risk differently than women uh and generally men underestimate what the risk is and women are like you know i could potentially more accurate so in se that sense when you think about running for office right you think of all the downsides and if you're a man you're a little bit like whatever, it'll be fine. The risk is low that I'll lose or be humiliated or something while the women look at it and they're like, I see all these downsides. I'm going to take a more cautious approach and not do it. And that's actually part of the thing. And it's actually an effect that um, carries on through, through other, through other fields too. Uh, it's a, uh, anyway, enough sociology on that. Uh, but yes, I would agree. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask Jennifer, you're, I mean, you're coming to us from Vancouver and uh, yeah. I, I mean, it's just a, it's a, it's like a random associated fact, but the minute that Adam told me about this project and, and then was, and I was able to read a copy and read these essays, it struck me as like, I mean, this is a real thing and the essays are real and personal, but it's, this is the type of thing that like Douglas Copeland would write a book about Douglas yeah. Copeland would write a book about this project. Yeah, and I'm glad you said Douglas Copeland because when I was I was younger, that was one of my favorite authors. So Me I, I think of him greatly. Actually, a lot of the stuff from Generation X, including the definitions that he had put in there, I still think about like uh, daily. Uh, but um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was one thing that we um, were sort of trying to fill that gap. And uh, I mean, you know, media is 
not it's declining it's shrinking it's not really getting bigger and a long time ago you might have read stories or essays like this and say uh your local newspaper like there would have been room for it or even you know magazines like saturday night which don't exist anymore uh and now like where do you read other canadians experience on on like their their lives like the the real um complex things that happen to them in, in a very human way right um we just i didn't see it and i certainly didn't see it in a canadian context like you can find a lot of american stuff if you go you know amazing buzzfeed long reads amazing stuff from the atlantic amazing all this stuff not to say that we're on that level <laughs> but you know like I, re I really wanted to see more um really good writing on these topics from Canadian authors. And I think we really achieved that. Well, I, I, you did achieve it. The book, the book itself is a masterpiece. I know we're going to get to talk to the illustrator, <gasps> uh, right? <laughs> like what? It, it's hardcover. It's stunning. It's um, Adam. What did it, when you first held the book in your hand and also, I believe it's prompted Sam's first ever three dimensional graphic on real talk. Am I correct or incorrect there? <gasps> I, I I mean yes, can you, can you but I also again? well I can put it up yeah sure look at, I, look at this it's our first 3D graphic I mean technically it's not technically someone's gonna write in and say it's not technically well I mean props to the midlife team because this is this is the first graphic I found on their website it was really really easy so we <laughs> stole it yeah we did we stole it well still um, sometimes genius steals and we, look at it but it's beautiful sparkles. it's beautiful so Adam the first time you held that in your hands and then and then I want to talk to you about what you wrote because I told Sam I, I had to stop reading your essay so I could get my composure to host the show today um, but was this an easy decision for you to get involved and, and now that you're holding the book in your hand what's this pandemic journey been like for you yeah I mean I make it a point to always say yes when Jennifer or Sarah tell me I need to be doing something <laughs> okay. so it was it was a very easy uh it was a very easy pitch. I mean, do you want to work with 26 other people who you love and have known for 20 years? Uh, I didn't even need to know what the, the content of the project was be. It was very, it was a very easy yes for me. And I mean, as mentioned, it's beautiful. Like the, the cover is this beautiful gold foil. And I know you're going to be talking to Ray Biesinger in a little while, but uh, when I finally held it in my hands, I was kind of like, I made a book, like we made a book together. We're published authors. It kind of went back to when I first started writing for The Gateway and the first time I ever saw my name in a byline, I just, I, I was beside myself and and the, the sort of the low key narcissism in me got amped up a little bit. And that's why I've continued to do, you know, journalism, creative media type things over over the last 20 years. Um, I You're also, good at it. he's very Thanks, good man. at it. And, and can I also say Adam that Adam would never say it, but just for everybody at home, just a little bit of tidbit of information. Uh, the day that I got fired, I had breakfast with three people who I intimately trust to talk for the very first time about a project that didn't have a name yet. Uh, and one of those three people around that breakfast table was Adam Rosenhart, and the thing is called Real Talk, and here we are talking right now about a book that you put together. So, Adam, you've been huge in a lot of people's lives, including me. I, I read this morning your words, knowing your dad is going to die soon shrinks your world, and it hit me like a ton of bricks, and I can't imagine what it was like for you to type that out. Take us into your piece. You know, it was uh, it was serendipity that that Jen and Sarah reached out with this project at a moment in my life. You know, having I turned forty in July, there's this pandemic happening, and just like finding out in December, two weeks before Christmas, that my dad has inoperable uh, small cell lung cancer. Like his prognosis is, in a period of time, he'll be gone, and this project gave me the opportunity to kind of parse how I felt about that and start dealing with it in a way that I, I, I would have had to do by laying out a bunch of cash with my therapist. So, so not only did it save me money, but it really did give me an opportunity to reflect on my relationship with my dad and what it means for a parent's life to come to an end and sort of watch the slow car crash of what that experience is like. Um, you know, when I wrote my first draft, Jen, Jen said, maybe you're too close to this. Like maybe this isn't the right thing to write about right now. And, and I had a lot of great feedback from both Jen and Sarah on that first draft. And I thought, you know what, 
I'm going to really push through. And cause I know there's something here and both of them saw something too, uh, that, that I can weave into this, that will not only make it a really interesting readable piece, but will also be a bit of a salve for me. So, you know, the only, the only sort of loose end is that my dad hasn't read it yet. And I am nervous because there are moments that I reveal in the essay that aren't, they're not all charitable. Like we've, I love my dad. Like I don't want him to die, but it, you know, with any parent relationship, it's been a bit of a rocky road. So, so, you know, I'm not sure what he's going to think of it, but I believe that I've poured the ups and downs and the deep love uh, that I have for my father into this essay. And I hope that he comes away feeling good about it and not like, God, I hope I die soon because that middle child of mine's a real piece of shit for writing this essay. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I mean, that's one reaction. I mean, now I'm revealing some deep-seated psychological problems I have about disappointing people in my life. That is what I pay my therapist for. The, the good news is, is that we can stream this interview as long as we need to. Adam, if you'd like to work everything out ultimately in front of thirty or 40,000 people, that's, the, you know, that's your prerogative. Um, I would imagine, I've never met your dad, but I would imagine that this would be an incredible honor for him to have an opportunity to, to read his son's thought as because like what's going through his mind. I try, I try to wrap my, I think a lot about, I don't know if I think more than the average person about death, but I think about it a lot. I don't know why I always have. And I, I feel like I'm going to start crying. I don't know why I love you, Adam. And I'm so sorry. You're going through this. Thanks, um, Ryan. We cried too. I, yeah. I, frankly, when you're talking about it right now, I'm like, can I, I don't have Kleenex within reach. I but, got to hold it together. <laughs> but it's like, you know, the people that are dying, I mean, there's like, what are they thinking about? I mean, I just, I think about these things and I, so Sarah, you decide, I mean, like when you're going to write you, you open up your heart and, and you give us enough information to understand the context and you write about pain and trauma and healing and the dynamic with your mom. And it's like, I mean, Adam's already sworn in this interview. So now I can say you guys didn't fuck around at all with this project. <laughs> did you? I mean, you made a commitment, Sarah, to come in here and just pour it out. <laughs> I think one of the rejected uh, titles for the book is uh, giving away our last fuck. And uh, I actually, <laughs> there's probably a couple more fucks still, uh, still back there, but I think everyone chose something brave. Everybody was brave. Everybody chose something courageous to write about. Nobody picked, we can all write an article about a smart article about this, that, and the other, but we wanted to share uh, parts of ourselves for each other. And the book was always intended first and foremost as a gift to each other. We never thought, Jen and I never strategized like, oh, what does the world need now? You know, what would sell? Uh, you know, what kind of, what can we do that other people haven't done? We simply said, hey friends, we're all at least 20 years older than we were when we first met, when we were those kids that were so smart and knew everything. And uh, this year has been tough. And if you hadn't already been thinking about difficult subjects like death or fertility, infertility, motherhood, not motherhood, um, you know, relationships, you were definitely thinking about it when you were locked up at home and, you know, you couldn't go see people at work. All of the mechanisms we used to cope were, I think, for many people stripped away. And it led to, you know, I, I of course, the pandemic has been terrible, um, but this project wouldn't have happened in terms of time and the space to have personal reflection were it not for these circumstances. And everybody in the book, uh, I think mine was, because I'm one of the co-publishers, was pulled out as like, whoa, that is so personal. But I actually thought, actually, they're all incredibly personal. And I'm just so proud of everyone who contributed. Yeah, they are. I mean, I feel like if I would have been invited to participate in this, I probably would have put together some ambiguous, wishy-washy, middle-of-the-road, you know, crap, and you would have all sent it back to me like an editor <laughs> might and say, redo. It's no good. Uh, Jennifer, what I loved is that, you know, you write, you know, when you hear or you have an opportunity to see women write or talk about pregnancy and and about their journey, and oftentimes it does reflect the the beauty of it and the magic of it, of course, I love that you divulged that, that you realized uh, in a pretty formative moment that you had been a bit of a snob about pregnancy, to use your yeah. words. Uh, that just jumped off the page at me. Yeah, totally, right? I mean, just think about it. When you think about pregnant women, I think of like soft focus pictures from like uh, 
uh, Instagram of like, you know, oh, welcome your little one, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, you know what? This is actually like a really physical process and one that like half the world has been going through. And in your brain, and definitely in my brain, I kind of just eliminated about that entire dimension of the world. And then only going through it was I like, oh yeah, <laughs> that was really hard. And uh, other people have gone through it. And why was I so dismissive of something that was super like, uh, like formative and to our to the human race right to the species like we've been doing this since forever so um so yeah it also helped me kind of understand that like maybe there's lots of things that i've been a snob about that i i shouldn't be let, let me read this this i always feel re weird reading someone's words to them but but i just like because i have it right in front of me here's a portion of what you write after the baby was born another birth of sorts occurred out came the placenta a dark and fleshy pile of guts shaped like a there hot water is. bottle which my body had created to nourish and protect the baby this entire time it sloshed around in a metal basin like a murky blood red jellyfish its presence slid another lens over my view of the world driving home the animal reality of human bodies in full right. HD. I was like, Phew. I mean, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and it's true, Ryan, you've seen this happen before. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I, I was just on another, I was just on another, I mean, yeesh, I can't even finish the sentence. I mean, it, 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 it's a miracle and it's wonderful and it's amazing and it's yeah. mind blowing. And you also realize, I mean, I mean, my moment yeah. came a little bit later because obviously I, 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 this may come as a surprise. I didn't actually deliver the baby. Carrie did, but, uh, oh, but yeah, it wasn't, yeah. it was actually, it was actually quite painful. I don't know what the women complained about. It was totally painless for me. It was, uh, um, but, but, but I remember getting our little guy home, like literally 10 seconds after we got him home and the, the car seat like, you know, you never drive more carefully than when you're driving your infant home from the hospital. And we put the car seat down in the middle of the living room and the house was completely silent. And I looked at Carrie and I was like, now what? Like, now yep. what? Like, <laughs> yes. Laundry. <laughs> Laundry. Yeah. <laughs> laundry yeah. <laughs> yeah and support where yeah. you can um this this pro first of all uh, and by the way credit to adam because i see that you're participating in this round table you're also participating on the live chat on youtube right now which is bonkers um oh. very well done uh, so adam i don't have to tell you that we already have this loosely formed unaffiliated uh real talk book club which our audience members have created uh which is absolutely amazing and they're already committing kaylin is anyway out of vancouver that they want to read this for the book club um oh, wow. so, uh, some people are, are are demanding like Deborah is demanding to know where she can get this book now people mm -hmm. uh, people are going to be disappointed maybe to hear that the first run at least as I understand it is already sold out Adam that's right yeah we uh we did a pre-sale uh for we'll call them friends and family and it went I think it exceeded our expectations I don't know about yeah. uh, Sarah and Jen and so we decided to do a second print run uh, of 700 copies is the plan. So if folks go to midlifebook.ca, they can buy the limited edition hardcover and you get a free ebook with it as well. So you don't have to wait for your book to come. You don't even have to crack it open because it will be a collector's item with Ray's artwork on the cover. <laughs> uh, you can buy a copy at midlifebook.ca anywhere in the United States and Canada. If you're international, you'll have to email us first and we'll make arrangements for the proper payment for shipping and all that. Can I mention that you uh, can also currently buy it at Daisy Chain and uh, Glass Bookshop? Audrey's had it, but they sold out. On oh, right on, right on. That's great, and it's great to see it in independent yeah. bookstores. Um, some of my favorites like that working. you just mentioned. Yeah, With no kidding, locals. no kidding, Sarah. We should also mention that the second run will be the final run. This was a difficult yes. decision to make because we probably could just keep printing, but. It, we wanted it to be truly unique and a limited a, a limited edition item. And we also have to carry on with our lives too. <laughs> so um, as beautiful as this has been, please capitalize on this now because it won't be forever. There's an event like all things in life. The EPUB is forever. Yeah, no the kidding. EPUB is forever. Can, can you tell us about, there's, a, there's kind of an event like in a, in a way, like a virtual launch tonight, right? Is this open yeah. to the public or did I just blow a secret? No, it absolutely is open to the public. Uh, it'll be on our YouTube and you can also watch it on our Facebook. Everything is linked on midlifebook.ca, eight o'clock tonight. Jen and I are gonna be co-hosting. We'll be sharing more about the origins of the book. Um, it's friends working with friends again. We're interviewing three of our contributors, Jake Deep Dudley, uh, Leanne Brown, a New York Times bestseller and Mayor Don Iveson. And we'll also be giving, I've reserved one copy of the hardcover. For us, it's the one uh, that we will be uh, giving away tonight. 
Oh, fun. Okay, very cool. Um, I, I'm trying to. I feel like you're all acting like I'm about to wrap this up. Um, you're, oh. you're, you're like you're I getting. Don't know. You're, so usually, you're, when you're, people ask where to buy it, we're you're, like, you're okay. getting. Usually, you're, no, I'm just all over the map, Jennifer. When I interview, okay. that, I just I just have no strategy. That's that's more the bigger problem. Um, we we usually talk over each other all the time, and we're just being professional for once. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Um, there are so many. I don't know if we want to go back into the heavy. I kind of do because my eyes dried up again now, I and, and yeah. I feel I feel I feel somewhat yeah. like 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 I have no like uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like you know uh, like a stone. Uh, I need to get my eyes all misty again. Um, um, but Adam, your your courage and what you wrote about and what you talked about is moving audience members. Um, you know, I mean, people like Trisha wow. says, you know, my parents both passed in 2019. It was a nightmare, uh, but I'm grateful they didn't have to endure the pandemic. Troy says the worst feeling ever watching my mom die from brain cancer over the course of 16 months was devastating. Haas says that his dad said, uh, please don't grieve. I may be uh, better off than you. <laughs> Haas said I couldn't argue with that logic. Linda Ray says my parents died together in a car crash in 2013. There are oh, no words God. for the level of grief. Um, Brenda says my mom passed away in 2019, also from cancer, says it was a very painful process for her and for her family to witness, but it was also one of the most intimate and life-affirming times for me, said Brenna. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is just beautiful. Tracy says she sat with her mom for the last 10 weeks. She says, it made me obsessed with death, but sort of in a good way, if that makes sense. She says, I say uh, that those weeks were her last better parenting moments to me. Hmm. I mean, these these are, you know, uh, a, a different Tracy went on to say, my mom has stopped all treatment and watching her have her down days is so difficult. We're so restricted in the pandemic, too, that we can't bring her to see family or friends one last time. And Terry makes a recommendation. She says, if anybody needs help with grief, check out Jeremy on Death Ed. I've, I've not read it. She says he's a guy from Provost who has amazing insight. Um, Terry says it helped me a lot when our baby died last year. Terry, I'm sorry for your loss. Um, Heavy D says losing a parent is, is and, and by the way, I'm gonna, I'm, I could read these all day. I mean, Adam, you've opened something <laughs> up here. Um, yeah. Heavy D well, says, Heavy D says losing a parent is unique and hard to describe tragedy. It hits you over and over. Heavy D says this is a beautiful interview. You know, it's, it is unique and yet it's not like death is something that happens all the time, every day. It's part of human existence. And, you know, the fact that the folks in the real talk chat are talking about this and really it's resonating with them really tells me it's not something we talk enough about. And, you know, it's, there's almost like this, I don't want to say shame, but that's kind of what it feels like sometimes, you know, is that people don't really know how to talk about it. They're worried that, bringing it up will make a conversation awkward, but this is like fundamental to the human experience. Hundreds, if not thousands of people are going through it right now. Some of us, it gets sprung on us. Some of us, like I said earlier, get to watch the slow motion car crash. So, so, you know, again, it's, it's a gift for me to be able to share with, with other folks, like my own thoughts on it, my own experiences as I, as I look back and, you know, I, I was deliberate in trying not to be overly nostalgic, I guess. A, a friend of ours, David Barry, wrote a great book called On Nostalgia. On Nostalgia. Real talkers mm -hmm. should add it to their reading list. But it, it's sort of about the, the perils and pitfalls of leaning into too much nostalgia because it's like it's, it's sort of false. So I wanted it to be true. And and I, I, when I visit my parents, like, so this happened starting in December, my wife and I decided we're going to ignore the provincial government. My parents live in Calgary. So we drove down to Calgary. We spent 10 days with them. I mean, we're, we're not supposed to, like, we're supposed to be in our own bubbles, but I said, fuck it. My dad's dying. So what are they going to do? Find me? I'll pay the fine. I don't care. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and we've spent a lot of time not talking about what dad wants, but like, what he remembers, like what's been interesting. And, and in, there's one point in the essay, the, the point at which I started writing the essay was a moment where I was sitting down to dinner with my mom and dad, and my dad was looking down at his hands. And for whatever reason, who knows, like we talked about what happens in people's minds when they're going through this. And he said, you know what my hands remind me of? And my mom grabbed his hand and said, they remind you of your father's hands. And he started crying and my mom started crying and I'm sitting there with a piece of bread in my mouth thinking, what <laughs> do I do? do oh like, God. what do I do in this moment? Am I, do I get up and comfort my dad? Do I let the moment pass? 
And as soon as dinner was done, we we're at, we're at a, a large dinner table for six. It's three of us. I reach over and grab my laptop and I start writing and I start writing exactly about how I felt in this moment. And I felt, I felt shitty writing about it. It felt a little too, um, little too personal, maybe a little too revealing, but I, I was like, this is it. This is the moment that's going to become the anchor for the story of what I write. And then, and then like, this is so crass, but like, you know, a few days later, the last day we were there, my dad has been undergoing chemotherapy. So he's losing a bit of his hair. And he said, I want you to shave my head. And as I, as I was shaving his head and trying to be in the moment, I was like, shit, this would be a really great part of the essay, you know, because I'm go, I'm feeling, I'm experiencing all these feelings and, and these emotions and this intimacy, like shaving someone's head is intimate, especially if they're a family member, at least in this moment of, of extreme vulnerability. So like I was, I had this experience that I was going through this meta experience of thinking, oh, this would be really good in the essay and going, why am I thinking that? Like, why am I thinking that right now? And, you know, so it's, it's been a bit of a roller coaster to go through all these little moments and try to document them and catalog them ostensibly that wind up in an essay that I'm very proud of, but it's weird. It's like this, this, this tension, I guess, about writing about it. I mean, I, I, yeah, go ahead. I, I just want to, like, one thing we've been talking about is that uh, all of us at the Gateway, all 27 of us, like, one of the reasons we did this was we're like language people. We like writing. Yeah. We like the communication side, and it's how we process stuff. So I think, Adam, your experience, I mean, yeah, like, that's real to me, right? Like, I think about when I've had yeah. vivid experiences in my life that I can't process. I'm like, because you need to talk to yourself, and and it's it's how we do it. And, and anyway, that just, to me, resonated, and it also made me go, you're not a narcissist, although maybe. <laughs> Thanks. You're a, you're a writer. Well, That's what you are. And it's how you see the world. Yeah. Adam, you can be a narcissist and be a great writer. So, you know, you, the two don't have to be mutually exclusive. <laughs> no. Many have. Yeah. Many have. Before. Many have. Uh, yeah, Ryan, I, I just, I wanted to touch on, you know, you were saying you've been thinking a lot about death and you always have. And then Adam has written something about death. I wrote about trauma. Um, and everybody, I'm, I'm not looking at the chat, but people are, it's touching people. And I think what you're going to really get from reading midlife is that grief is nonlinear, especially for those of us have, who have undergone grief. It's nonlinear. Uh, you can push it away as much as you like. You can put it in a box. It's still going to be there. Um, there are many different kinds of grief. Grief can take a long time to process, but it's also something that brings us all together. I mean, nobody wants to feel bad, right? And another one of our funny taglines for the book is feel good about feeling bad. And I think that's true in so much as we're encouraging people to, to feel, you know, I feel happy, feel the joy. Also, don't be afraid of that feeling of sadness because it doesn't feel good. And I think uh, most of us like to be in control of our lives. And so obviously, if you would have the choice, you would never choose to feel bad because who wants that? But that is simply not reality. And having tools, having a community to have those unpleasant feelings with, uh, to have a safe place to be able to express emotion and to cry and then not to feel like people are going to think I'm weak. People are going to think I'm sick. You know, people are going to think this. Who cares about what people think? You have feelings and your grief is valid and your story is valid no matter what. And when you read midlife, you'll see how courageous everybody has been. Yeah. I, can I can I add to that? Is you that can, you can do okay? whatever you want, now my we're friend. Like tag teaming. Oh, Ryan, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to add to Sarah, like Sarah, that's really beautiful. I totally agree. And I think we've also reflected on this current, the current world we live in, which is super social media, visual image based, really shows the perfection. Like it likes to, to you know, th those are the things you see, what's perfect. And we all know, like we were journalists, all of this, we know that's not the reality. Like everyone's going through these other things off camera. And uh, we wanted to talk about those things. But I also wanted to add, I, we're talking about death right now. And that was actually partly like in a long game, I'm not currently experiencing people in my current circle, like going through a death, grieving, except for Adam. Um, but the, uh, the, um, the long game of death was a th thought when, as we were putting this book together in the sense of 
you know, we are all going to die someday, right? And uh, um, in midlife, you know, in early in life, you think you're going to be like a rock star or whoever. You're going to be the CEO who, you know, revolutionizes the industry and all that. And then as you kind of leave that and you go into midlife, you're like, oh, no, I guess I've got some things, but, you know, I'm just going to be basically an ordinary human being. And when I thought about that uh, for this this entire book, it was like, well, okay, someday I'm going to die. Does that mean that all the stories I have are not worth telling? And I was like, that can't be right because everybody on earth, you know, we should all just like, you know, stop doing everything we're doing if it just, if we mean nothing. And, uh, and we knew that the stories that we had in this book were a way of talking about those stories, what it is like to be an ordinary human at this point, like in all the joy and the grief and everything. And uh, something about the collection, I mean, Adam's piece standing as one of 27, we're in, we're in, in encompassing like an entire group's experience of what this is like, I think, was like, honestly, such a surprise about how special it was. Like we knew everyone was going to do uh, something amazing, but when you put it all together, it is uh, like, it's sort of breathtaking. We were not expecting this, quite frankly, like that you you get this and then you read it all through and you're like, oh my God, I've just mainlined like an intense, like, uh, you know, <laughs> like emotional experience that, you know, I, I, like I've, I've talked to my people about it and they're like, yeah, I was, you kind of need to take a walk after each one mm. and then be like, think about it. And, it. and it sits with you and there's something special about it, each of the stories being related in the sense that this happens to a group of friends who all know each other. So you have like these, stories of, um, you know, someone who doesn't want children, someone who really wants children and can't, and uh, someone who has the children and like, that's also like insane and, and, and all of that. And, and so anyway, it works as a piece. We were so surprised. It's magical. We want everybody to read it. And we're so glad you had the experience. Well, Jen, it's beautiful. Are you, Jen, are you- are you saying that the original or the secondary piece that I had teed up about how to correctly load a dishwasher might not have worked in this book? I think it would have. <laughs> well, were, were there, was it, was it chock full of metaphors, Adam, or was it just literally how to load a dishwasher? I think it probably would have just been an instruction manual that would have only applied to my long suffering wife. I think. <laughs> I think that you can actually learn a lot of this is the least profound thing I'll say this week, but you can learn a lot about somebody by how they load a dishwasher. Agreed. So this has been a subject of conversation yeah, on so our happy. Slack. Um, yeah. Like, what's your favorite stove burner? Like, threads upon threads for months about the yeah. merits of each one and why, and also how to load the dishwasher. Um, apparently, Jennifer's husband has a very specific way he does that. I sent him a picture of my load once, and um, apparently the bottom rack was looking okay, but the top rack, he he couldn't comment. He was very diplomatic about it. He's that. an engineer, like you guys were talking about. Oh, He's an does engineer. he wear a pinky and ring? He, Yes, correct. He does. Uh, and he has induced a sense of learned helplessness into all of us about how to load the dishwasher. So we just kind of stack them and we're like, that's your job now. Yeah. So I actually like don't know how to do it. Yeah. Okay. Well, it sounds to me like he asked for it. So he, he, yes, wants, to yeah. take, he wants to take that job. He could take that job. Um, <laughs> Whatever he was wrong. <laughs> yeah. Tracy says uh, on our live chat, the best advice I got when mom was dying was uh, somebody told me to write down as much as I could. And she says, I did. And I ended up with a book. Um, oh. Deborah says, what a powerful segment that brings our own emotions of loved ones past. Deborah just hits the nail on the head there. She says, I would love to hear a segment to further the stories of loved ones. Um, you know what? I, earlier I saw uh, Fatima said, does anybody remember the chicken soup for the soul series? She said those were so fantastic. <laughs> yeah. and, then, and then I see Amanda yeah. Ash. Uh, Amanda is part of our next three that we're now 27 minutes late and joining. But I mean, really, Ooh. you know, hey, commit to real talk at your own peril uh, right off your morning. Um, <laughs> yeah. But but Amanda said we're like chicken soup for the middle aged soul, which I thought was yes. you know, a pretty good one. Um I, I just I just think this is remarkable. I do want to get to, to three more contributors here. Um, yeah. They're ready to talk about their own experiences. So uh, Adam Rosenhart, Jennifer Pablano, uh, Sarah Chan, huge congratulations on this project. It's absolutely I, I never use Thanks, this Ryan. word. It is tremendous. I save that oh, word for when wow. it fits. I save it for when it fits. Well done. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. For Thank you. Us. Thank you. You bet. So that's Jennifer, Adam and Sarah. Uh, you know, 
what can I say about the pieces? I mean, we're just talking about it. We haven't even read them in their entirety yet. It's not like I've read the pieces, the essays on the show. Amazing. And you have to check this book out if you can. By the way, Jennifer talked about, you know, people that want to have kids and, and, and then people that want to but can't. And I thought it might be a good reminder if you missed our show yesterday. It's it's Infertility Awareness Week. And we had a really powerful conversation, a panel discussion uh, yesterday. Make sure you check it out uh, either on our YouTube channel or, of course, you can subscribe to our podcast. We're, we're going to meet three more contributors to this project in just a moment let me remind you right now that if you're looking at upgrading your ride one of the smartest moves you can make right now if you're thinking an suv or a truck in particular is to go check out st albert or sherwood dodge they've been known for a long time to have the best selection of both the ram truck lineup as well as the jeep lineup anywhere in alberta two dealerships that can work together to make sure you get the perfect whip you're looking for including that 2021 jeep cherokee sport 4x4 this is the one that lists over 40 grand right now for 34,990, and that includes the leather wrapped steering wheel, the touch Bluetooth screen, all the bells and whistles you'd expect in an SUV that you'll pay twice as much for at St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge. Also, big shout out to the team at Westworld Computers. You know by now they are who powers the Real Talk Studio. And while you may not be looking to buy new right now, don't rule out upgrading your equipment. Yeah, your laptop's slowing down. You're sick and tired of it. You've had it for 10 years, but you can't afford new or it doesn't work with your budget. Daryl and his team have some gently pre-owned, ready-to-go items. They got the software reinstalled. They're re-warrantied. And of course, they come with that personal customer relationship that Westworld's been so proud of for more than 40 years. Clean Air Club, you know, is the way that you can save money and have your family breathe easier. It's because they're all about clean air in the house. Have we ever focused more on the air we breathe than this past year? Have we ever wanted to be more proactive about controlling our own circumstance? A big part of that in your home is changing your furnace filters. You go to cleanairclub.ca, you let them know the size you need. Oftentimes the very next day, they're on your doorstep, you swap them in, and you pay less than you would in store at cleanairclub.ca. We're talking about Midlife Book, which is just a really remarkable pandemic project. Uh, Almost 30 people formerly involved in different capacities in The Gateway. It's the official student newspaper, the official student media source at the University of Alberta. It's a real pleasure to welcome to the program three more contributors. Amanda Ash is a recovering post-media journalist and a talented one at that, currently working as a digital media specialist in Edmonton. She volunteered at the Gateway uh, for many years before she became the arts and entertainment editor in 2006-2007. She says she regrets not wearing earplugs to all the concerts she reviewed. I hope that Amanda can hear me. Amanda, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? It's great to have you here on the show, my friend. (laughs) Jeff Moisa. Uh, (laughs) Jeff wrote music reviews, interviews, and features for the Gateway as well as alt-weekly C magazine you may recognize his name from bylines there between 98 and 2004 just as for some reason he then moved to toronto and became a lawyer taking with him a number of cds that he has failed to review he occasionally contributes to the globe and mail travel section Uh, jeff welcome and raymond biesinger uh raymond is the genius behind the artwork uh that magnificent cover of this publication raymond was circulation manager managing editor at the gateway in the early 2000s uh, but his writing slowly gave way to illustration and art he was lucky enough to draw for the globe and mail and saturday night may it rest in peace uh since then his clients and partners have included wired the new yorker the guardian monocle new science audi the Baffler, Dwell, The Economist, Le Monde, Nylon, Spin, Pitchfork, Sub Pop. Now you're just showing off, man. Do I have to read this entire list? Raymond, Sorry. Raymond, welcome to the show. Thanks for being oh. here, you three. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you. Uh, Amanda, Thanks. this is, we were just talking about uh, Adam and, and, and whether or not he felt that it was gauche or tacky uh, to be writing things down, things that were occurring to him as he's, as he's spending cherished time with his father um your piece is a little bit different but a little bit the same and i think that a ton of parents of young kids can relate to that that desire to scribble down the cute little things that your kids say and wonder what might happen if you don't oh totally um and you know there's so many more 
that have just like been said and now they're they're gone that I haven't had a chance to to write but you know whenever I get a chance to (laughs) taking out my phone and trying to write them down because man kids say some you know not, not only funny things but really they're they're so observant they they have this different perspective of of life and it's honestly it's taught me a lot I think (laughs) did you like when when you uh were were starting like do do you have a plan I guess with regards to the things you're writing down like I mean so there's there's this project that you're taking part in which is just remarkable but when you're writing down your little guy's comments like we had a we had viewers talking about the add to cart phenomenon earlier and I love that you wrote about that with your little guy maybe you could share that but do you have a plan with this or is this just something personal for you at this point you just want to be able to cherish these innocent and wonderful statements for years to come Really it's just it's it's just for me it's just a, a way for me to document you know these things he's saying I don't really have a plan for them other than to maybe look back on them and and see how he's grown because you know when you're taking care of these little people every day you don't really kind of see that progression it's only when you look back at their baby pictures of course when I don't know if you do this to Ryan but of course when they're sleeping and they're little angels and you're like oh I miss them so much and an hour earlier you're like oh go to bed <laughs> um you know like you look back at those baby pictures like oh they were so sweet I want to go kiss them I want to go hug them and you're like no no do not wake the child like no um so yeah for me like to get back to your question it's it's, it's definitely more about just kind of keeping track of, you know, how, how they're growing, how they're, how they're becoming these incredible human beings. And in, in a way, and I kind of get into this in my essay a little bit, is it's also a little bit of a reflection and a little bit of, uh, it makes you feel good as a parent that you know, maybe I think I'm, maybe I've done something right. Like maybe I'm not a complete failure here as a parent, you know, I might have, you know, we may have had pizza for dinner three days in a row. Um, but you know what, they're growing up to be kind and generous and observant and smart. And really that's all you can ask for. Uh, I would imagine pizza for dinner three nights in a row. You're probably the most popular mom on the block. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well done. Hey, Jeff, you, uh, you know, this, this movie, this film with Gwyneth Paltrow sliding doors, it's, it's a really interesting film about, I mean, if people that don't know it, uh, sort of, you know, how, how, how missing a train in this instance can, can completely change the entire course of your life. Will you tell us about this letter discovered in a jacket pocket from many years ago? And did you know right away that this is what you were going to write about? Yeah, um, a little bit. I think uh, when we got the notice of like when we figured out we were going to do this project and what it was, uh, Sarah and Jen said we're and we eventually decided we're going to write these personal essays about you know reaching the stage of life that we have, which immediately caused me to panic because um, we would all have to write you know something vulnerable and something personal. Um, and I, I guess for for me arriving at you know the age I'm at with midlife is you know, time to take stock. And I think as we age, uh, we become a little bit more self-aware about what what drives us and our decisions, uh, hopefully anyways. And uh, I, you know, I was taking stock of where I had ended up in my life and and where I could have ended up. And I always had a bit of this, I guess, obsession with this idea of other lives lived or unlived and and like the unknowable um, nature of, of what could have been. And like th- that letter. So uh, it's interesting that that was something that I described in the book that, um, you know, my, my father was um, uh, he, he was applying for a fellowship in New Zealand and would have got it. But for the fact that like a letter um, didn't get mailed and sat in a, or not even mailed, but hand delivered a letter of reference and sat in a, a jacket undelivered. Um, and so instead of New Zealand, my parents ended up in uh, Winnipeg, which not quite the same thing. Um, and, and, you know, it's just, it's such a, something like that is, it's like a physical object that is tied to this really exotic location um, that has this like untold story about it that I've, so when my parents told me about that, I think, you know, they thought of it as like, a, oh, that's too bad. And what could have been kind of story with, without thinking about it too much more. But for me, I kind of fixated on that. And it became this like symbol uh, in my life that I would revisit and think, well, like what's, what's New Zealand Jeff doing now? So, um, um, I, I felt pretty strongly that that was what the essay was going to center on. Um, the sliding doors element uh, was just 
uh, a weird thing that um, I hadn't watched the movie, uh, even though I was a little bit obsessed with it as well. Uh, and so when I finally did watch it this year, uh, I was like, yeah, these, this, these themes are pretty similar. So I'm going to find a way to tie it in. Did, I did not enjoy that movie. Did, <laughs> did, did writing about it? Uh, was, was there more of a, did it impact you more than maybe you anticipated? Yeah, it's, I mean, writing about these things, I think like Adam mentioned when he was, um, you know, he madly broke out his laptop to start in real time processing, a, you know, this, this momentous event for him. Um, it, it forces you to articulate your feelings and sort of describe them. And that causes you to then start to deal with them. Um, and uh, so I, I think the, for me, the process of, um, you know, sitting down is sort of in an academic way thinking, what, what is it about unlived lives that, um, causes us to uh, sort of gaze on them or fixate on them. Uh, and then the other part is like, you know, through that discipline of writing about it and and writing about the various um, the facets of it, you then confront your own feelings about it. So I, I think I went through, and I think everyone probably who contributed to this book went through a bit of a, a journey uh, when they were writing what they did. Um, and, uh, you know, it, I'm not sure where I thought I was going to end up when I started writing my essay. And so the conclusions that I came to, I think were pretty organic at the time. Um, and I may revisit them and think, yeah, no, that, it, like when we do the next installment of midlife, which is going to be old age or regrets or, or something like that, that that's, that's when I'll probably revisit whatever I wrote and say that was nonsense. But for, for now it, it sort of represents, um, you know, real, um, I guess, hard earned, um, uh, yeah, realization of, of where I've ended up and what those decisions have meant. Raymond, can you, um, I mean, it's, it's the, the, the book itself. I mean, the writing is fabulous and powerful, the illustration, the presentation of the book is just stunning. Um, as Sam puts up the cover, um, can you take us through the, the design process and tell us how you approach this project as, as such an experienced illustrator and graphic artist? Oh, absolutely. Um, I guess it all kind of starts back in mid-November of last year when uh, Mary Jane McAllister, who's one of the art directors for the New York Times' At Home page, said, hey, um, we need you to make a maze. And I'd never thought of making a maze before, um, but it was just one of those moments where she clearly knew me better than I knew me. And so we ended up making this bad boy, which was like a section front maze about wow. just passing time in COVID times. So when Jen um, sent out the email to everyone about uh, contributing to midlife, there was no talk about a cover but I kind of just immediately knew that I needed to do it because I owed the gateway and these people so much of my, my career because it, it sprung straight out of it. So originally I was going to send them three different ideas, but soon the utility of, of making a maze uh, became evident where a maze has many different dead ends, dead ends, many different destinations. There can be, there's obviously a middle and end and a beginning, but there's all these other parts that you can explore um, accidentally or intentionally. And it became a very good metaphor for what we were doing. And then typographically, the, the notion of a large M, um, you could put the title of the book right in the middle. It is actually the only thing that uh, uh, someone who's looking at the cover has to go through besides being born and dying. I mean, otherwise there's education, there's a condom standing for uh, like promiscuity in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, <laughs> and uh, a BA, uh, a G for the gateway, a family, again, optional, love, again, optional, uh, decline, the arrow down, mystery, the question mark, money, the erotic, the medical, sadness, prescription drugs, uh, five minutes to midnight, and death. So take your pick. Which ones do you want, Ryan? Um <laughs> I mean, what was it? Promiscuity and money uh, in the university years would have been nice. I had neither, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Raymond, this is so. So you I mean, you were there. You were circulation manager. You were managing editor for anybody that understands <clears throat> how a university paper or, or for that matter, any paper might work. That that means a lot of the boring stuff too. the 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 actual like uh, ins you have to do like actually responsible jobs and probably adhere to deadlines and ensure that things. So how did you transition? out of that uh ensuring that everything was proper and organized and and then and then all of a sudden you, you maybe maybe not a new talent i'm sure you, i'm sure you're always a, probably a great illustrator even as a kid but what an interesting transition to go from writing into illustrating well it was i, I think you're giving managing editor too much credit at the time i basically did uh 
like coordinated the opinion section and the comics. And so what got me into illustration was um, there was a, a managing editor, Mike Winters, who needed uh, to fill some comic space. And I was good at telling a story, but I honestly hadn't drawn anything for like a decade. Like I, I, I was in school for politics and history and, and art wasn't something that I did. Um, but yeah, it started, I started doing like narrative comics at university, at the gateway, uh, started doing writing a lot. And then I really, really wanted the, um, the arts and entertainment job, but I was rejected and I was very angry. And my way of getting uh, revenge on the gateway was to send a bunch of samples to every every magazine and newspaper in Canada. Um, it's you know, a just tough like job, right? Pardon? <laughs> it's a tough job. Yeah. And, I would have hired you. Oh, I know. And, and Adam Rosenhart got the job instead. Uh, but the, um, anyway, and so I, I just sent like house party handbills and some of my comics around and they all hired me like Globe and Mail Saturday night. That became my part time job during university. And then it, and, and that like developed while I was managing editor. So I wasn't paying as much attention to it as I should, maybe. But um, yeah, and then I got in at the New York Times, which was great. And then Monocle picked me up right when they were blowing up. And then blah, 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 blah. 20 years later, here we are. It's amazing. I, I just signed. I just followed you on Instagram, by the way. Your Instagram is beautiful. So this 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 project brings together in a way like like is it is it fair to say uh, I would imagine that, you know, each of you probably stayed in touch with maybe a handful of, of other collaborators on this project. But Amanda, was this in a way it kind of feels like a like almost like a class reunion. It has a bit of that vibe to it. Oh, 100 percent. And, you know, it's it's funny because it couldn't have come honestly at a at a better time you know in a way this project was a bit of a a light in in kind of this darkness for me and I don't think I fully realized um how much I needed this camaraderie and and this connection and this outlet for creativity and until Sarah kind of you know approached me and, and and until I started writing my piece for the book you know this past year has been extremely difficult for a lot of people um and you know for me specifically um it it was really tough um it's all my family grieve unfortunately i lost my grandfather to covid on christmas day um a week before he was supposed to get vaccinated um so you know grief didn't really seem real because of everything happening, you know, we were only allowed 10 people um, at the funeral, we weren't allowed to hug, we weren't allowed to do things that families do when they're grieving. And, you know, I, I think I kept that grief in a little bit and I kind of became lost. And when Sarah reached out to me and, you know, told me that we were doing this and everyone was getting back together and, you know, the band was getting back together, I just felt so lifted up and so inspired and, to be around all these brilliant people who cared and who were also going through their own their own stuff and this sense of community really i think it really helped me and almost kind of saved me from from this year which has been just a dumpster fire dumpster fire might be <clears throat> might be underestimating it i feel like we <laughs> we use dumpster fire to describe things prior to covid-19 that now we realize we're just like flickering embers in, in like a waste paper basket. We had, we had no context about what a dumpster fire can look like. Is that a fair comment? Unreal. Oh, uh, yes. Yes. Um, I think there's probably some other choice words, but you know, I think in, in the previous segment, there were a lot of F bombs and, and, and stuff there. So my, my goal for this segment is to keep, keep it, it clean. Let's see keep, how, let's see how far that, that goes. <laughs> I think everybody's yeah, doing, gonna... doing a remarkable job of keeping it classy so far, Jeff. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna keep it clean for the children. We're gonna keep um, it clean. You know, it's yeah, it's it was um like the way we all got back together to Amanda's point was it was pretty remarkable. Like the, I think the emails went out in late December, and like it's now what April, and we have like a full hardcover book. Um, like they we managed to corral twenty seven different contributors. Um, Sarah and Jen were just like super pros about it, um, and it it 
you know, it, I think it was unique that we were able to do it because of COVID. Like we were able to get away with this insanely expedited timeline. Um, but it was also like inspiring to see um, like everything that's been done on this book is sort of in-house. Like Ray did the amazing art. Uh, we have this amazing media and social media team that includes like Amanda and Adam uh, and like every, like Dave Zeban did the website and like it all is super professional, but it's all done by the, the contributors to the project. It's not like we're hiring people to do this. And it's just been like in a addition to working with all these amazing people that we hung out with in the university and like you pick up these conversations like you never left um it's just so gratifying to see like what everyone's become like everyone's this like super competent professional person and what they what they do which i'm not sure if we were all sitting around rat um it, like back in the early 2000s that anyone would have predicted such a high hit rate for our group we're not failures. Yay. Yeah, we're not failures. <laughs> I, this is an interesting comment here from Hope, uh, who's watching and says, my biggest sadness or my biggest regret is not being able to attend university. Uh, I always feel a bit empty in that particular regard, says Hope. Um, I've had conversations. This isn't lost on me that I had conversations um, with with current students at the U of A's faculty of law. Just I think it was like, I don't know, about a week ago about a 65% tuition increase there. And we've had MBA students write the show as well. They're looking at a 70% increase to tuition. And, you know, I, a lot of people are talking about how university is going to be more and more out of reach, most especially for students uh, from marginalized backgrounds, rural students, uh, black, indigenous uh, students of color, uh, and, and the list goes on. Uh, Raymond, was that, was that something? I mean, when you look back on this project, was, was the, the university experience, and even more specifically, the student publication experience, is a, did, it, did it kind of reiterate to you the, the enormous role that it played in launching both your professional career and then probably also have a, having a pretty big influence on your life? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, for me, without the gateway and without starting to do comics and editorial cartoons, none of this would have happened for me. And, and one thing that I've really noticed professionally in the last 20 years is the sensation that all the, the rungs that I went on, you know, the Edmonton Journal having a budget for illustration, uh, arts weeklies, these just disappear. And I guess in a greater societal way, you know, in the 1960s education, like post-secondary in Canada was incredibly inexpensive and you know even when i went to university the difference between the the late 90s early 2000s and then was enormous and i just can't imagine how different the prices are from back then and now and what that does for social mobility um and for people to to find themselves um yeah it is uh quite stunning and and i think very much a mistake for governments to not consider this a priority as much anymore Jeff, did you have the same experience? I mean, was there was there sort of that reflective element where that caused you to sort of think uh, maybe even a little bit more deeply into that that era of your life? Did it take you back in that way? A hundred percent. And um, first of all, law school tuitions are ridiculous. Oh. Uh, that's like it, I, I went to law school like. I don't know, 15 years ago or something like that. And they were ridiculous then. It's disheartening to hear that they're just as ridiculous. Do you now. remember what um, do you remember what you paid uh, a year approximately for tuition 15 years ago? So when I was at U of A, like doing undergrad grad work, I think I was paying like three or four thousand dollars a year. Yeah. Um, and then I started law school at U of A, and I think I was paying like the eight or something. And then I did the dumb thing, which was transfer out to U of T, where at the time they were charging like twenty thousand dollars a year, and they were like. Yeah. And so that's when I started to go deeply in debt um, for a period of time, which was a lot of fun. But no, it's, you know, these are barriers, I think, that to raise point need to be seriously looked at um, because the experience we got in university, um, quite aside from the class experience and the, and the training we got was um, like we, we got to bond through this newspaper experience where essentially what they did is they took um, they gave a bunch of kids like a, a multi hundred thousand of dollar a year budgets and a lot of arcane printing equipment and told them like, you're going to print a physical newspaper twice a week, which is insane. Like that's so much work for people that are like, they're carrying uh, class loads. They have other obligations. Um, and also like go put out this professional newspaper with multiple sections, photography, um, a, a real budget that you have to interact with the students union. Uh, I, I never was an editor, so I didn't get to shoulder really any of that, which was lucky. I just had to do the right but like it's a, it's an immense amount of work and an immense amount of responsibility but it's also i think 
for me, where I had by far the most fun in university was working with this group of people, um, hanging out in the gateway offices in the basement of the students union um, late at night, uh, frequently drinking. And um, like, despite you be behaving like an idiot, you would produce this incredibly professional uh, product at the end of it uh, as like 19, 20 year olds. And like, for whatever we went on to do after that, it's just like, I can't think of better training, like actual practical training. Work that, hard, play hard, Jeff. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that is what it is. I, 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 I didn't. I never attended the U of A. I didn't. I, I never worked, obviously, for the Gateway. Um, but I, I was editor in chief uh, of Mars Hill, which was Trinity Western University student newspaper, and I similar experience, obviously. Um, you know, almost every night. Um, you know, uh, burning the midnight, oil, burning the four a.m. oil, and and doing virtually no studying or preparation for any university class, barely making it through, but but pouring your life and caring so deeply about that paper issue that would come out every two weeks. And, um, you know, I mean, I, I even just think about the fact that even the basement office, why are they always the basement offices? We had a basement office, too. It was so hot in there, um, and, and it, was, it was gnarly, and it was right next door. We had a physical yearbook. I don't know if the U of A did as well, but like an actual physical hardcover yearbook that came out every year called The Pillar. The editor-in-chief of The Pillar and myself, the editor-in-chief of the Mars Hill, um, Josh Dunford, he's now the managing director of Relay Communications, which owns this show, this flagship show on uh, out of Relay Communications. I mean, so that it's like 25 years later, literally, we are collaborating on this project, talking about the project you're all collaborating on, all of us brought together by student publications. It, it, it's kind of, I mean, it's almost mind-blowing. I'd, I'd almost tell a student that if you could attend university just to work on the publication or just to work for the media source and not actually attend classes, uh, <laughs> you may in a certain context be a little bit better off, Amanda. 100%. Like, you know, going to university... I actually didn't even start in classes that were, you know, I ended up doing an English degree um, in my undergrad, but I didn't even start in English classes. I was actually in science classes trying to take my prereq prerequisites to go into pharmacy. And then I discovered this beautiful um, paper that was being put out twice a week. And I just like so I, I, I felt like I, I wasn't quite belonging um, and I was spending all my time kind of working on my English course, single course, um, the one the one arts course amongst all of my science courses. And and, you know, I finally got up the nerve to go up to the gateway and kind of, you know, in my tiny little squeaky voice in my like little sensible sweater being like, hi, like, I'd like to write for you. And um, they just like welcomed you in with open arms and you just realize that these people were all kind of just like you, like they had so many different interests, but they were smart and they were all just kind of looking for something that was really fulfilling. And it was at that point, I decided to switch my majors. Um, it was not a fun conversation with my parents at the time uh -huh. um, to say, oh, I'm not going to become a pharmacist anymore. I'm going to become a writer. <laughs> so um, that was interesting. Uh, but yeah, and, you know, going in there and starting to volunteer and then just becoming really you know, honing in on your writing skills and becoming creative and, and learning so much about newspapers. And then from there becoming um, the arts and entertainment editor, which, you know, you kind of talked about that burning of the midnight oil. Like there were days, you know, the, that we would have press days and you'd go to your classes. And then from class, you would be going straight to the, the gateway to um, start laying out the paper, finish editing all the pieces from your volunteers and, um, and then once that's the paper is done, you of course had to go for a drink at Rat um, because that was a necessity. And then after that, you're going home, working from say 12 or 1 a.m. to write your paper that's due at 8 a.m. So it was just, I mean, I could never do that again. I, I can't even have a beer without, you know, being out for three days anymore. Um, <laughs> that's midlife for you. Um, and I can't, you know, I can't survive on less than eight hours anymore because like, oh my God, the bags are just like there now. I could just roll out of bed and I'm like, whoo, look at me. Um, so yeah, it's, it's incredible to think just like how much work we put into that and the sense of community we developed and also just like, the, the physical product, like what we did, what we made. And I'm getting that sense again today with midlife. Like we can, we still got it. Like we, we could put this together. Yeah. We're in a pandemic. It's fine. Some of us have kids, 
no problem. We got day jobs. Let's work on this at night. So that's kind of how it's been. It's been burning the midnight oil for the last four months. And it's really fulfilling to see that we could, <laughs> we could still do it. Well, I think people are probably going to take you up. <clears throat> you're joking earlier about whatever you're going to call it, like regrets or, or old age, or whatever you call the next book. But I, I mean, I, I just think that you have to, quite frankly, Raymond, I don't know. Maybe it starts with you. Maybe you do the cover before you talk to anybody. (laughs) And then there you have it. Um, I I just know there's, I mean, I'm just watching even right now as you're talking, what our audience is saying and our audience is kind of twisted. Like they're still, they're still hung up on the, how to load a dishwasher thing, which was brought up by (laughs) the previous round table, like an hour ago. And they're still debating that, but they're also indicating how much they value this conversation. I love our audience. They're like me. They're just every, shiny things, shiny things, everybody. Um, but I think there'd be a huge demand for it, just like there is with this. Um, sincere congratulations to the three of you. Um, before we let you go, I, I just want to, Sam, if we can take my screen and show off Raymond's Instagram. This is unbelievable. Um, this is stunning. Raymond, can you, can you tell us, like, generally speaking, are these all, have these all been published somewhere, everything we're seeing here? Um, they're a mix of personal work and um, commission work. So like lately, like just today, I have something out with Time Magazine. I've done some stuff with Road and Track lately. There's some stuff. Oh, oh I could talk about this forever. Um, there's some like hardcore album covers. There's the Neurologist Journal of the United States adopted me for like 18 covers, which is insane. Um yeah, it goes on and on and on. What's this the, one here? The, what's what's this? Cana- what one? is this? This it looks like a Canadian stamp. Okay, that's not mine. Every oh, that's not yours. While, okay, I uh, just post about an Instagram account that I'm excited about. Got it. And so that one was for Federal Identity, which is a a physical archive of Canadian government designed paraphernalia. So posters, stamps, um, that kind of thing, brochures. So it, it seems like, I mean, I'm a fan of Canadian design. There's something, especially from the 50s to the 70s, there's a very like modernist but low budget approach that kind of matches my own aesthetic. So I, I try to show those things off as much as I can as well. Love it. Does anybody, Greg wants to know on our live chat, if anybody ever tells you, Raymond, that you look like a young Stephen King, you ever get that? No. Um, <laughs> someone has said I'm, I look like the new guy who does Spock you, or who is Spock. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then that's about it. That's about it. Okay. I think it's a compliment. At least, at least they didn't say he looks like an older Stephen King. You wouldn't want that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. No, I think it's a compliment. Hey, to the three of you and and to the the rest of the entire team, I mean, almost 30 that have come together on this. First of all, congratulations. Second of all, thanks for sharing your insights and your time and your talent with us. And and I know tonight's going to be a big night for you with this this virtual launch and the celebration of the project. It's absolutely remarkable. The Midlife Launch Party, you can follow it on YouTube and Facebook. Just follow the hashtag Midlife Book. Uh, it's a live screen tonight. And as you heard, I think it was Sarah Chan that that said they're, they are going to be giving away one of the hardcover copies. You can, of course, still buy your copies. And I just got a report from Adam Rosenhart, uh, who says apparently the sales have, have ramped up a little bit. Real talkers have been inspired to pick this thing up through the course of this interview. So so Amanda Ash, Jeff Moisa, uh, Ray Raymond Biesinger, thank you so much for joining us and uh, and have a wonderful rest of your day. You thank you so Ryan. much, Ryan. You bet. What a cool project. What a cool book. Sam, you have been so animated off camera. What's this been like for you to listen? I feel because you it's feel been p- like, yeah, I, I mean, like the thing for me is it's just like I, I like every single one of these gateway stories that comes up. I have probably some version of it in my head. I mean, I was. I was an engineering student that would like carry my like you know carry my camera around between classes and try and sneak photo assignments in in like the hour I had to go from this class to this class and I'd stumble in late to the next class because I was out shooting something for the paper and and that's just what we did like we're just like yeah class is secondary to putting this thing on and you know I mean the gateway is where I kind of said this media thing is going to become plan A and engineering is going to be plan B. And that was a very weird choice to make to the point where I actually considered changing my degree, but, um, you know, was was too stubborn to go through more years of university. So I kind of made this little shift into the media world and, and, and this 
institution, like not only just the gateway, but, you know, I was very involved in Cambridge Press and, and just campus media in general is this unbelievably fascinating sort of microcosm and sandbox of where good media projects are produced and and like frankly this midlife book is is positive proof of that is like you know when you put these scrappy underdog teams together that make these newspapers and we still don't know how we did it but we did um you can do something pretty incredible and so i just like i've i've been beaming from ear to ear just hearing about these stories because i do have like total experiences in my life that that absolutely parallel what they're talking about and it just yeah warms the cockles of my heart uh, i was i and i think and, and i think that so many people are uh, are relating in their own way or finding their own parallels like i like how many of you um when adam was talking about his dad it's a rhetorical question because you were telling us our audience we had a moment didn't we as a community we had a moment when adam was talking about his dad how many of you were thinking of your own parents or thinking of your kids we all were when you read these, like when I read uh, Jennifer talking about the, the placenta, like that's that's sort of. But I love how she said, what did she say? It was like a, it was like a blood red lens came over her view of the world, humanity in HD or whatever. Her Like I wanted to read that part to the audience because I was like, that is just wordsmithing. But you can relate if you're a mom, if you've if you've if you've had that experience in a way that nobody else can. And then on university, like Brenna writes in and says, my parents have great memories of attending University of Alberta in the late 60s, a radical time with hope for a different kind of future. Good stories of organizing protests and hosting the Black Panthers and more. You know, Linda says, I finally got my university degree at 45 with distinction. At 21, Linda says she had her diploma in business admin. Uh, at the top of her class both years, she says her biggest regret is not going on to law school. Says Linda, I'm too old to think of that challenge now. Well, I don't know, Linda. She says to say nothing of the fact that I could never come up with the tuition, which is m more understandable. I saw somebody earlier in the live chat saying that they know somebody or they saw somebody that's graduating from university at 73, which I think is just absolutely fantastic. Did you hear that story? Oh, it was a couple of years ago and and I'm I'm blanking at what university it was, but a, a mother and daughter graduated together for right. nursing? Right. Yeah. Yes. Wasn't yeah. that? Yeah, well, maybe we can Google that. See we, when yeah. see when we have a chase producer starting on Monday, ah, uh, starting on Monday, you're going to meet her. This is what she can do. It she, we'll make eye contact and she'll be like and then she'll come up and she'll say you're talking about da, da, yeah. da, 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 you know and then and then real talk is going to be that much better. And you know why by the way that is? You know why we're able to hire a chase producer and do a whole bunch of other cool things and and, and do I want to divulge what else we're doing these days or I'm always I'm always spilling things out and then later being like I'm not I'm supposed yeah, to Yeah, you're keep... very good at planting seeds and then having to follow up on them. What it is I'm I'm a very poor executive in the sense that I don't have you know when like a company will make a big announcement and you're like I played golf with the guy last week how did I not know? I'm the guy that will tell you all the things. Um it's why we're looking at expanding our space. It's why we're shopping around for new studio because we're growing uh, and we can only grow with the support of you and you do that in a number of ways our patreon subscribers at ryanjesperson.com you click on patreon you learn more about that uh, play a huge role in growing this show and that's why we're able to add another team member and we're not done yet and it's also due to the amazing support of our advertisers like the dairy queens of northwest edmonton and sherwood park Speaking of announcing things before I should have, I, I floated the idea of a promo code like last week. And I said, I'm going to be talking to Dairy Queen about this. And then and then as I was saying it, I was going, you know, you should, you should probably have the conversation with the client before you tell the audience you're having a conversation with the client. Eh, I talked to them yesterday. They said, well, we didn't mind. They said it was our idea. So we didn't mind. And, and so Mark and Michelle and, and Michael are very excited to let you know that starting May 1st, there's going to be little incentives. There's going to be incentives for real talkers. And there's going to be some added incentives uh huh, for our Patreon subscribers. And I'm really excited about that. So incentives to come starting in May. Right now, let me remind you, I had forgotten about something at Dairy Queen. Like, not like forgotten about it, but I was reminded yesterday when I talked to them. The treats of pizza. Can we, first of oh, all, can, yes. can, it, it's not a cake. It's not a pie. It's a treat, it's a pizza, and it's one of the funnest things to say. I mean, I think peanut buster parfait might be the funnest thing to say, but treats a pizza might might come a close second, or maybe it's vice versa. 
Yeah, it's hard to say because they're both delicious too. Because I was trying to think this like, well, one might be fun to say and one might be fun to eat, but they're both both. They're both both. Yeah. Maybe that should be the billboard. <laughs> they're fun to say, fun to eat. Both are both. Find them at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton in Sherwood Park. There it is, wrapped up with a bow. Starting May 1st, we're going to tell you more about deals. And these are going to be exclusive to Real Talkers. So you're going to have a leg up. You're, you you choose whether or not you want to tell your neighbor that if they drop the Real Talk name or if they mention Jespo at the drive through window, they're going to get whatever deal every month. Because it's going to be a different deal every month, and we're really excited about it. Also excited, of course, about our extended partnership with the team at Local Waste. The reason why I saved this for right now is to remind you that tomorrow we will wrap up our show with another rowdy edition of Trash Talk presented by Local Waste, which means we're taking your emails now to talk at ryanjesperson.com. What is driving you nuts? What do you need to blow off steam about? I would all but guarantee there will be at least one Trash Talk submission that we will read tomorrow about loading dishwashers. I would almost guarantee somebody will write in about that. At localwaste.ca, you'll learn how you can partner with Local Waste to, well, quite frankly, get better service when it comes to the business of, of garbage and waste and recycling management. They've been doing it for a quarter century. They're proud to be locally and family-owned, and they love to talk trash and earn your business along the way. You can find Chris, Mikkel, and Lauren at localwaste.ca. I didn't see a strong reaction, uh, Sam Brooks, from you uh, when, when, when conversation was underway on the live chat and when some of our panelists briefly discussed how to load a dishwasher. You seem to me you're a very organized guy. You're a very detail-oriented guy. You and I are a little bit different on those regards. And something tells me that you're probably not a haphazard dishwasher loader. I wouldn't say I'm a haphazard dishwasher loader. I'm very I'm, – I'm a huge believer – of quickly hand washing things that just take up space in the dishwasher. So like very rarely will you ever see me put like a pot or a mixing bowl in the dishwasher because that's just eating up space and that's a, you know, that's a pain to deal with later and you can't get as much stuff in. What I was actually thinking about during that conversation is I, I have, uh, you know, one of my friends and, and a group of my friends all used to be roommates together and the dishwasher at their house had rules. Oh, did it have rules. You really? You did not put a fork and a knife in the same section of the cutlery basket. There was like a specific place for everything and the plates had to be in a specific way. And like these were the household rules that everybody lived there, agreed to. And, and I put a fork in the wrong place one day. Well, you what you've established now is that there's there's different. I mean, we could we could we could discuss plate placement. We could discuss cutlery placement, not just forks, knives and spoons together or separate, but also some people, the, the people that do it wrong. Uh, and this is just a fact. There's no room for debate. Uh, this is an area that is black and white, right and wrong. Uh, there are people that do it wrong and have the cutlery pointing up. In other words, the, the, the prongs of the fork are pointing up. Uh, let me tell you why that's the wrong way to do it. Number one, the water is typically coming from the bottom. Although I don't know the most about like the new innovative dishwasher design. I could be wrong. Maybe it's top and bottom. But also, when you're removing the cutlery from the dishwasher, what are you doing putting your grimy, mucky hands all over the prongs of the fork, right? All over the, the what do you call it? The, the cusp? Uh, the, 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 the parabola, what would you call it, of the spoon? The, the, the ladle portion of the spoon? Um, you see, you put your grimy finger hands on... on, on you got to have it with the handles up. What are you up. doing with your hands before you unload the dishwasher? Well, just hands are filthy. You don't well, want Yeah, and typically right next to the dishwasher, there's a sink to wash your hands Does in. Does everybody wash their hands before unloading the dishwasher? I do. I don't trust everybody to wash their hands. I, 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 I actually put forks face up because the tines get cleaner that way. Sa Sam, okay, so I mean, I, unfortunately, I mean, I, I like to compliment you on typically being right. In this circumstance, unfortunately, Sam, I've checked with our panel of Real Talk judges, and you are wrong on this regard. Um, you know, two things have formed my opinion on, on washing hands. Uh, being a man and attending any sort of public gathering that has public washrooms, and, and I should say three of my powers of observation— and and people would be more, although I think maybe this is one of the positive things that the pandemic will change. I'm glad everyone's eating their breakfast, depending on when you're listening to this. Maybe the, you might be listening to this right before dinner, which in which case I apologize. But most men, I would say publicly, well, maybe let's say 50 percent do not wash their hands after they use the washer. Would you agree 50 percent anecdotally? I have been at a bar once, gone into the washroom, seen a guy didn't wash his hands, 
seen him go back to the bar and start chatting up some girl. And I like leaned over and said, was like, hey, by the way, that guy doesn't wash his hands. You did that? Yeah. Sam, <laughs> you trying to get your ass kicked? No, I'm trying to get people to wash their damn hands. <laughs> Was this before or after the... Oh, I guess it was... It was way before the Way pandemic. before the... Oh, yeah. What are you doing in a packed bar? I guess it would have been way before. This is where we find out that Sam's part of the underground. We find out right now that Sam's been attending Grace Life Church the entire time, not divulging to us. First rule of underground church is you don't discuss underground <laughs> church. Okay, stop. We got to stop. We can't do it. We can't do it. <laughs> Deborah's a little concerned right now on the live chat. Deborah, is Sam still going to be on the show? Um... No, we, we mercilessly cut him loose. We hired a new producer. My contract's up. Sam's gone. Yeah. Uh, Sam, of course, will still be on the show. Sam is the technical producer of the show. Sam makes sure that, that, that the cameras look amazing, the light looks amazing, the sound sounds amazing, the Zoom is great, the guests are lined up, the website is fine. Sam does a million things. Moderates the live chat, takes notes, cuts clips, does an amazing job. On the editorial side, I've been booking the show for five months and hosting it and trying to grow the business. And I'm quite frankly, my friends, if you stayed this long into this broadcast, you, you deserve a little peek behind the curtain. I'm exhausted. And I am so excited to add uh, our, I just about said her name. I don't know why it's some big secret, but I, you know, should we say, I'm going to, I'm going to float a little, I'm going to float it. I'm going to float it. Her name is first name is Sarah and Sarah. You've stayed this long. You're 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 two hours and thirteen minutes into the broadcast. You deserve to know that our new producer's first name is Sarah, and we're so excited to introduce you to her and what she's gonna. She's taking over a, a huge portion, the lion's share of the editorial booking of the show. She's gonna be lining up the guests. She's gonna be getting the background information. She's a very talented writer. Uh, we're lucky to have her. Quite frankly, I, I didn't say this. And I won't say it until she's signed on. Right? We 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 didn't say. I don't know why she applied for the job. She's way she's overqualified for this job. Uh, and we're so excited to have her, and she's a huge add to the team. So that means that I can take a bit of a step back from that, focus on hosting and growing the business. Sarah's going to run the editorial. Sam's going to be continue to nail it on the technical side, and we're going to be this this kind of three headed monster that comes at you. And she'll be on camera every day too. So uh, we're very much looking forward to to adding her to our team. So tomorrow. Very excited about what's in store, including this roundtable. I've been teasing it for a while. We've had them booked uh, for a couple of weeks now, and I'm really excited to step in the doors of what could be the greenest house in Canada, a sustainable build that'll blow your mind. And we're going to talk to the team that made it happen. That's just one of the highlights to come here on Real Talk. In the meantime, have a great day. We'll talk to you soon.